committee. So just if I could advise members then the committee meeting will be recorded. Broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online and remind those in the public gallery they're welcome to use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted. Um, with no apologies um, received. Um, and just move on. And I've no chairperson's business. Um, item number three then is the draft minutes. If I could refer members to the draft minutes at tab three, page five of the meeting pack, are members content with the minutes as drafted? Yeah. Um, members, if I could refer you to the correspondence and table papers, uh, your table papers pack at tab four point one from um, community pharmacy and I regarding the reduction in future funding and. I would assume members may wish to return to this um, when the minister is in attendance. Obviously, we we had representatives in attendance last week, and this is a follow up to that. Um, are there any other matters arising that members wish to raise? No. Okay. Um, item number five then is the briefing from the minister. If I could invite, invite the minister and officials. You're very welcome. Um, in attendance today, we have um, the Minister of Health, Robin Swan, MLA, Jim Wilkinson, Deputy Secretary, Head of Health and Care Policy Group, Chris Matthews, Deputy Secretary, uh, Resource and Co Corporate Management Group, and Bridget Worth, um, Director for Finance. So you're all very welcome, and we appreciate um, to date we've had very positive engagement with um, departmental officials both in formal meetings and informal meetings, and also the receipt of papers and responses to um, any letters have been very prompt. So we're very grateful for that. So um, if we could invite the Minister then to, to make his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Chair. And I, I hope that positive engagement continues throughout the day as well. So, look, and again, I want to thank you and I want to thank members for the opportunity to attend today's meeting. And I do look forward to that constructive working relationship with the committee that through throughout throughout my time in office, because I do value uh, and appreciate the work and the role of committees, they are central to the vit vitality of this assembly. And of course, you would expect me to say that as a former committee chair as well. So, I also want to place on record my appreciation to the health committee in the last assembly mandate, which conducted its affairs during a very difficult period, as as we all remember. I'm conscious that I will be placing early asks uh, on this committee in terms of legislation, uh, but that's sadly unavoidable given the two years without an executive or assembly that we've gone <coughs> through. But I do trust, Chair, that between us, the committee and my department will strike that correct balance in terms of providing that democratic scrutiny of legislation and also, as you have said, avoiding delays or backlog pressures. An early priority for me on the legislation front will be ensuring that Northern Ireland is covered by the terms of the UK Government's Tobacco and Vapes Bill, and I believe you're having a brief from that after this. Um, this planned legislation will make it illegal to sell tobacco products to anyone born on or after the 1st of January 2009, and will also provide powers to allow for further regulatory measures to address youth vaping. And I believe it actually offers a significant opportunity to take, tackle a public health scourge, uh, and I do want Northern Ireland, and I don't want sorry Northern Ireland to be left behind. In year one of the legislative programme, I also want to bring forward a new health protection legislative framework for Northern Ireland, a public health protection bill which actually replaces the Public Health Act Northern Ireland 1967. That bill will include emergency powers that, alongside similar legislation already in place in England, Scotland and Wales will enable us to better manage 21st century public emergencies. So, Chair, turning to wider issues, I wanted to outline my vision today for the future of health and social care services, because I think we can all agree that we are at a critical juncture. It is, of course, important to emphasise that our health service and its staff are still doing amazing work every day. We all have good reason in our own lives to be eternally grateful for the compassion and the excellence that they provide, and we, we can reflect too on how the health service has developed in its 75-year history, and now routine treatments that would have been unimaginable back then uh, are now a common day occurrence, and they're remarkable 
increase actually in life expectancy. Nevertheless, we now have a system that is in deep trouble. And I'm not going to sugarcoat that because I owe it to patients and staff to be both honest and frank. Some of our pressures are experienced in other jurisdictions too, the double whammy of budgetary constraints on one hand and the growing demand for care from an ageing population on the other is not unique to us. But we do have our own deep-seated problems as well. Our system was already in trouble long before 2020. Political stagnation, the stop-start nature of the executive and assembly, repeated failures to agree multi-year budget settlements and the associated short-term totally counterproductive decisions that were sometimes sub subsequently taken. Those broader financial pressures, missed opportunities to reform and of course growing waiting lists. Then came the pandemic with all that, that was involved for, for patients, for services, for staff and for their growing backlogs of care. But it didn't stop there either. The subsequent cost of living crisis did not just impact on households and businesses. There has been a cost to government crisis too, with pay and other running costs inevitably climbing sharply as inflation has soared. And that brings us to the point we now find ourselves in, in common with other executive ministers. I'm looking down the barrel of an inadequate budget for 24-25, while also facing growing need and demand. And that's why I warned publicly in recent weeks that the next year will be largely about <coughs> Tammy's limitation. And that's the reality, and it would be wrong, I believe, to pretend otherwise. So as I stated, the, the risks of service breakdown are real and are growing in a range of areas. And by that, I, I don't mean we'll wake up one morning and the health service will have simply toppled over. It will be more gradual. It will be more insidious than that. It will be a slow motion slide that in reality has already been at play. And I know that the committee chair has already heard from departmental finance officials and that this engagement will continue. But I want to make two points on the budgetary situation before I move on. Firstly, the need for productivity and efficiency savings has never been more present. This will be a relentless focus for my department and is an absolute priority for me. This committee has already heard from our trust chief executives about the pressures that they're facing in terms of making savings. And as part of the drive for efficiencies, my department will be supported by an NHS-wide expertise. That's coming in the form of a getting it right first time review. Look forward to its assessment on whether and where further savings may be identified. However, and I believe that this needs to be shouted from the rooftops, productivity and efficiency savings alone will not be enough to bridge the funding gap. They are part of the answer, but far from the whole answer. And anyone who suggests otherwise, I believe, is in denial. Because successive health ministers from different parties will have sat in front of health committees and set out how health funding needs to increase significantly on an annual basis. And next year and beyond, we will also have the recurrent costs of this year's uh, pay settlements. And as members will know, pay settlements are for life. They're not just for the moment when an executive is reformed and ministers walk back in from a wilderness. Secondly, on the budget, I fully understand that other ministers and departments are also facing severe financial pressures. They will be making competing bids for additional resources, and I'm sure their party colleagues will be naturally sympathetic to those bids, because I would expect nothing less. But there will be an unavoidable real-life consequence for patients, staff and services if health is left with an entirely inadequate budget. There would also be a, an irony if Assembly members voted through such an outcome and then continued to fill my meal bag with more demands for more spending across all parts of health and social care, or indeed if they grabbed placards and joined rallies against cutbacks. Irony would be one word for that, Chair, uh, and I think others would be available. But let's now turn to the longer term and how we can turn around the great ship that I believe is health and social care. Because, Chair, I do believe it is doable. 
with the right combination of ambition, funding and joined up political leadership. Let me repeat, I do believe it is doable. We know what is needed and I will set out in conclusion three key component parts of that. The first, I believe, is to prioritise primary and social care because without that our citizens will not get the support that they need to live healthily and independent lives. Without that, our hospitals will continue to struggle more and more each year, and the more we increase pressure on our hospitals, the less capacity we will have to bring down our waiting lists. Secondly, it's important to be clear that we have route maps in place for the future. We will need to not just continue, but accelerate our progress along them. Those route maps include the, the cancer, mental health and urgent and emergency care strategies that I have published and alongside the elective care framework. We're already beginning to see an impact. However, the pace and scale will be impacted by the budget we have available. Our elective care framework, for example, has already produced some welcome results with its emphasis on service reviews and improvements and creating centres of elective activity throughout our established establishment of elective care hubs, and that includes our day procedure and our overnight care centres. Chair, in relation to inpatient and day case patients, the latest published waiting list showed a reduction for the <coughs> sixth successive quarter. That's the longest sustained reduction since at least 2008. Overall, there, have been a, there has been a 6.4 reduction in patients waiting for inpatient and day case admissions compared to the 30th of September 2023 and a 12.7% reduction since the 30th of December 2022. That's 14,259 fewer patients. And I'm confident that improvements can and will continue in some areas and there are others since taking office five weeks ago where I've actually tasked officials to also now consider. And as committee members, you'll probably be aware, aware of the specific ask that I have sent to executive colleagues in relation to targeted waiting list initiatives for next year. We have, of course, a very long way still to go uh, in that. In Workforce 2, we have seen some concrete results of continued investment. Uh, our focus on workforce development has supported a 15.7% increase in whole time equivalent staff in post actually across health and social care in Northern Ireland between March 2018 and December 2023. That includes an 18.4% increase in medical and dental staff, a 16.8% increase in registered nursing and midwifery staff, and a 21.5% increase in professional and technical staff. The latest published figures of health and social care vacancies as of the 31st of December last year still showed, unfortunately, 5,906 <coughs> vacancies actively being recruited to. That's still an overall vacancy rate of 7%, and since the 31st of December, the number of active, active HSE vacancies in recruitment has also seen a downward trend, decreasing by 2,410 vacancies. That's down to 5,906 <coughs> as of the 31st of December last year. Chair, that brings me to my third and final point, on mapping out a better long-term future, and that's reform. You will be aware, I hope, on the scale of the Encompass programme for creating a digital record for patients. That's crucial to so much of what we hope to achieve across our system. But also in terms of reform, uh, my department is finalising the acute system blueprint, which I commissioned on the future shape of our hospital network. That will set out how, how we can best make use of our entire hospital estate and the role that each hospital can play within that and working effectively as a whole system network, both locally within the trust areas and actually increasingly regionally. It will not set out precise locations for each medical speciality at this point and that will require ongoing clinical-led processes. However, I do believe that that blueprint will provide greater clarity to the public and staff on what hospital reconfiguration will actually look like and what it can achieve. The key outcome will be clarity for citizens and what services they can expect and clear patient pathways with a focus on the safety, quality and efficiency of those pathways and how services can be assessed. 
So as I've said, transforming our health service is doable. There are priorities, primary and social care, driving forward our strategic plans and delivering a reconfigured hospital system, all underpinned by advancing our technology and workforce agendas. But pace and indeed scale will be heavily dependent on funding. And in conclusion, Chair, I'll return to my warning about a year of damage limitation and the comparison of the health service to a great ship. Because when a ship is battered by a dangerous storm, the overriding focus will inevitably be on keeping it afloat and away from the rocks. That is what I fear 24-25 is likely going to be mainly looking like. There are limited opportunities mid-storm to debate how we got here or whether we should build a better mast or sails. We must, of course, instead plan ahead for those calmer waters while accepting that we're not there yet, but we can get there. Chair, thank you for allowing me to make those opening statements in regard to where I see we currently are as well. And I do say when I, when I return to the committee, I'll, I'll not be as long. Thank you, Minister. And I suppose just to say from the outset, I don't think any of us here are under any illusion just how challenging the situation is. Um, and everything that we have discussed so far in, in this committee reflects um, what you have said. Um, however, there are a number of issues, I suppose, that we, we will want to tease out. Um, and you, you've alluded to it in your opening statement, Minister, around the, you know, the workforce issue. And that, for me, is, is crucial to um, any reform, but also to tackling the issues instead of the constant firefighting that we're seeing and you're seeing... Um, every day. So at least I'm going to ask a number of questions and then I'll, I'll open up to members um, and we're conscious obviously of time so hopefully we can keep responses as brief as well and succinct so that everybody can get the best out of this because we do appreciate your time. So Minister, just I suppose initially then obviously the paying conditions um, for, for our health and social care workers and the junior doctors and I'm very pleased to say today um, that there has been an agreement now to, for negotiations to start with the junior doctors in the next fortnight, which is very positive, and hopefully we can reach um, a positive settlement around that as well. Um, <clears throat> and, and we're waiting on um, some of the other sectors, the nurses and others, to um, to ballot their their staff on what has been offered. Um, so on the back of that, I mean, at this stage, have you had any? I suppose particularly on the junior doctors uh, piece. Has there been any engagement with your counterparts in England? Because I know um, one of the things the Department said you're waiting on on some of the developments around that um, to see how things will move forward. And do you expect then there could be potentially a bar and a consequential coming from that that may assist with some of the pressures here? And I, I think that is a, a fair point, Chair, in regards to pay and terms and conditions, especially in pay, is about the bar and a consequential. Because unlike um, England and Wales, part of our health pay pressure is actually our social care, which don't fall under the same remit um, in England. So when they get a, an uplift, when we get the Barnet consequential, it's not a direct percentage carry across as well. So that always does present us pressures. I met with Victoria Atkins, who's the, the Secretary of State of Health and Social Care, on Monday morning in regards to that, and they have ongoing engagement still in regards to junior doctors. They are hopeful in regards to where they've got with consultants, and that will give us a read across there as well. So we are engaged, but uh, like yourself, I do welcome the response from junior doctors that we will engage, uh, and they have said initially to look around pay terms and conditions for 24-25. I've always been clear I, I want to look at the wider package as well in regards to even contract reform, because we do have an imbalance here in Northern Ireland in regards to what is their base salary and what they get as percentages, allowances or bonuses compared to England and just that mis that, that mismatch which I think we could work on productively and I hope to engage in regards to that. So I, I think the sign over the next fortnight that we are meeting again and we are willing to engage is a positive one. I had offered uh, to bring in Labour Relations Agency, I think as, you, as you're aware, should that be necessary. But both <coughs> sides at this stage of us have... Uh, had that positive engagement that we we, do, we don't think we need that at this stage, but the offer still remains on the table. Uh, 
and that's good to hear you talking about the contract because I know that's that is a big part of of um, the issue that the doctors um, have have highlighted. Um, I'll move on quickly, I suppose, because I'm conscious there is quite a number of questions. But um, this morning you will have be aware that the the dentist, the the BDA, were presenting to the Windsor Framework Committee as well, and the dental contracts are are a huge issue, probably um, more critical than maybe we realised in that um, we're in a, a position that. Um, we're going to have a very, very diminished NHS dentistry service if, if um, some of these issues aren't addressed soon. So I would like to, to hear from you just where, where you see that at. Um, I think certainly the, the issue that is clear for me is that the costing for NHS dentistry compared to what um, the delivery of the service, it, it's, it's coming in, it's actually costing dentists to deliver that. Um, and I think that's a, a very important issue primarily for the dentists themselves but also for um for i suppose particularly those people who are reliant on an nhs um dentist who will be the ones who will be most affected so if we can have an update on that um minister i think it would be very helpful and also around their contracts because i know that they are seeking a new contract um as the the chair said in regards to that engagement this morning over specifically over amalgam and i know yeah. that's the the change of what can't be supplied we are still under EU regulations, so when that change uh, or transfer away from mercury-based um, fillings does come in, we have to follow the EU directive. My readout and my advice still is that that has not been agreed or settled within the European Union, so there is still some scope in regards to that, and then it's how we actually apply it here uh, in Northern Ireland. It's one of those strange ones, Chair, that, that, that because it's a mercury based decision and environmental actually falls under DARA and DEFRA, who are the two lead departments on it, although the outworkings actually directly affect affect health, not just in NHS industry, but across the industry as well. So we are engaged, BDA has met with my officials in regards to having conversations about what that may look like should it happen. I have departmental officials looking as to what should happen or what could happen if we are taking down the route of having to follow the EU in supply, uh, in having to use, uh, the, the, I can't remember the term, it's the white-based film, which is about five times more expensive than the, the amalgam film. So there are, are pieces of work ongoing should we unfortunately fall into having to follow the EU time frame rather than the rest of the UK's in regards to that. In regards to specific contract negotiations, uh, I'm due to meet BDA within the next fortnight in regards just to a, a, an initial meeting since I've I've taken up office again. I have moved in regard to actually uh, applying uh, DDRB in regards to payment for, for dentists in regards to where they sit within that general dental services <coughs> contract uh, just in regards to that. And I'm currently uh, considering um, investment proposals for further support for our general dental services contract for next year, which will be shared with the BDA as soon as possible through my, my officials' engagement with them. And I think it's important to say, even though the amalgam piece is obviously going to drive costs up further, there is an issue where, where it's been long-term underfunding as well that, that has led to, to where we are. Um, just, I suppose, on the back of the GP as well, the GP, the GP indemnity scheme, and I know in, in some of the, the papers provided, um, we talked, you've, we've got some information around um, the GAD, have advised about updating um, the analysis they have in relation to cost and all that, but I'm just wondering if there's any update on where... If we're any closer to identifying options for the indemnity scheme, we we have identified an, a number of options that we're currently talking uh, with the <coughs> GPs. With uh, I, I think we're due, we're due to meet them shortly in regards to putting those offers to them. Actually, the briefing I just had before this meeting chair revolves some 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 talks of, of what we can do within the financial pressures that I'm already looking at at 23 20, or 24 25. We were able to put in place uh, a small, I think, recompense in regards uh, for indem indemnity costs at the end of last year for GPs, and I want to see how we can further support them in regards to that because it is a key issue in regards to negotiations. I'm also looking at a wider piece around our uh, GMS contract with GPs as to how we can better shape that and even in regards to qual for fame work. So there is progress there, and I think there is pro good progress currently been made with GPs and BMA in regards to that. You know, that's, I mean, the case, I think the indemnity is a very complex issue. 
Um, so the first focus is to see what we can do within the parameters of the current arrangements. Obviously, there's obviously, and you refer to it, a significant business case looking at what might happen in terms of mm -hmm. a future indemnity scheme, but very much so in terms of the small approach last year was to recognise indemnity costs for increasing to identify where they're increasing and then to try and intervene to see if you can offset that that was primarily focused around winter pressures and additional hours that we were asking gps to work on the consequences of for indemnity uh, but it, it did point to a sort of direction of travel where we try and focus in on indemnity as a single issue rather than as part of the all of our costs yeah okay well that's something we'll maybe continue to engage on anyway just to monitor the progress three more things i'll just ask them together because i'm conscious of time as well so Last week, you'll be aware we had community pharmacy and um, to brief the committee, and I know they're still in a, in a um, <coughs> space that things aren't progressing as as we hoped. It is again similar to some of the other issues we've talked about, a very critical issue, and we are seeing the real pressures that it's having on community ph pharmacy, which will also impact on on our wider community. So if we can get away updating that, particularly around um, the drug tariffs issue and and the the fact that English drug tariff is aren't are being used here, but the community pharmacists are very strong in that that um, doesn't doesn't work well um, for, for the service they're delivering. And also, if you can give any update on the review of the cost of service analysis, because that's obviously um, one of the key issues. And the two other things I just wanted to raise was around the, the children's hospice and, and the funding model around that, because I think um, I would like to see some work in terms of um, reviewing that for the longer term uh, future, because I know there are some varying perspectives on what the model is and what is actually being implemented and I would be keen to hear that because it is uh, it is the only one of its kind in the north and secondly just if there's any um, update on if the department are reviewing the child care ratios for um, registered child minders and child care providers because obviously this is an executive priority um, and it forms part of that discussion that comes under the remit of the department so that's me thank you okay thank you um, <coughs> starting with your last question uh, first is probably the easiest one. Yes, we are. Uh, I hope to have a paper um, or recommendations, and I'll share with the committee towards the end of next month. In regards to potential review, and that we do have to go out to consultation in regards to that. If I can, it will be as short as legal consultation as we po possibly can, because we are aware uh, of the, the differences in ratios in childcare between ourselves. England as we uh, Wales as well, so there's a piece of work that's ongoing. We're in the place where we can soon publish a consultation on that, so it is something we've been actively looking at. In regards to community pharmacy, uh, again a challenging situation that we're in, both uh, financial and I think there was uh, pressures financially in regards to what monies they could receive, uh, why there was no sitting executive or assembly in regards to the investment of DDR, even the application of DDRB and other funding models. I did meet with them um, at the start of, sorry, in the middle of last month, and was able to progress a, a 10.1 million advance payment to try to get to the end of this financial year to make sure we could get that surety. Uh, that was bringing forward 6.1 million of, as, as I said, the DDRB, uh, additional 4 million in regard to respective actually service pressures, which brings their overall funding allocation this year up until, re up until a, a, around the region of, of 145 million. In regards to the drugs tariff piece we are looking at, there's a piece of work that I, I committed my officials to engage with CPNI in regards to what that looks like because it's not just as simple as lifting another jurisdiction's model and applying it here without looking at what other costs and payments are also based as well so we make sure we're getting that fully rounded package. I, I will be clear, I've always been clear uh, even when I do meet uh, community pharmacy, they are a critical part of, mm -hmm. of our, over health our overall health network in regards to the services that they supply. But also, I, I personally believe the services that they can supply as well, because I think they are an undertopped resource. Mm -hmm. But again, it comes back to the funding pressures in regards to what I can actually engage with them and get them to do as well. So th there's challenges with the drugs tariff at the minute, which I, I think we can we can work through. My top department has received assurances actually on an ongoing basis that the pricing by suppliers to Northern Ireland remains on a par with other parts of the UK uh, and when the evidence is provided around individual issues within our Northern Ireland market we have mechanisms for consideration and adjustment and again the overall consideration 
is whether there's an impact on the delivery uh, of, of the profit margin and again itself. So uh, we, we are engaged around those models um, and I think margin expectation with financial uh, abilities that I have is something I think I'm going to have to manage with large parts of our sector, as I said in my, my opening comment. It's not that we don't want to do it, it's what we have the envelope and the ability to do. And I know that's not going to be particularly welcome um, news, but I suppose if we look at it in terms of the capacity of community pharmacy, if we see any pharmacies, which we hope won't happen, closing, there's no capacity in the system then for the patients then to go elsewhere and all of those issues around access and drugs. So I think from the committee's perspective, we would really urge that what whatever can be done should be done because... Um, we, we're, we're very aware of what the situation is and how critical it is. So, no, Chair, and I think we're not on opposite sides. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we're actually on opposite sides from community pharmacy yeah. either. It's just about well, where we currently are in regards to the support that we can give. I, I, I firmly believe that they, they're a crucial part of our network. They're a key partner. We've, well, I believe we have a good working relationship with them, and I know the financial pressures they're under, and that's why I moved to give that $10.1 million uh, actually, in this financial year, to get that, I suppose, give them breathing space till we get to the end of this financial year to see what further we can do. Uh, in regards to children's hospice, uh, and you mentioned the, the funding model specifically uh, around that, um, there has been, a, and again, and it's, it's that uh, conversation that we have with not just children's hospice, but hospice in, in general, about the 50 50 funding model that was committed to by Des Brown back in 2005 and there always has been a mismatch of um, I suppose perception and understanding as to what the 50% is whether it's running cost of their model or what we and, and the department or even the health and social care board believes is 50% of a baseline cost of supplying a palliative care bed but again it's engagement we're having Chris maybe do you want to so it, this has really been an ongoing conversation for a number of years with the hospitals. As the minister says, um, our ideal outcome is that we provide a fair settlement to keep those services running. The challenge we've had, is, as the minister said, is we, we have very limited room to manoeuvre. So any increases in expenditure in any area are being taken money off somewhere else. So the issue is to try and make these decisions kind of in the round as opposed to thinking of them individually. That means, I think, you know, trying to balance the decisions, trying to get an understanding of the general perspective for the general scope of the issues we're dealing with. Um, but that's not to say that we're unsympathetic to any of these particular <coughs> services. It's really to say that we have a number of extremely difficult funding issues in front of us. We know we're not going to have enough resources to cover them all. So that means making some decisions around where our kind of best value, where the best impact for the citizen is going to come that requires us to think about more than just one particular service, which is very difficult for anyone to hear. It's very difficult to us to have to deal with, to have to think about, but that's the nature of the situation we're in. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll open up then, Linda. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the Minister and, and to the departmental officials. J just to pick up on that last point, and, and I accept what you're saying, because I understand the position that you're in, and I think we've all been very clear, we understand you're in a difficult financial position. But I think we also need to look at where do you think these people are going to go if the hospice service collapses? Because they're going to end up in the health service anyhow. So we need to establish, is there a saving by, by having the hospice service? And I think there can be no doubt on this earth. We all collect, I mean, I'm sure plenty of people around this table have their own local hospice in a way, certainly collect for the southern area hospice, which, which covers my area. Um, and they do an awful lot of fundraising. So they are very much reliant in the first on themselves so i think that that having to top that up is a much better way and a, a much more efficient way for the health service and also the service is different the service is absolutely exceptional outstanding but it is very different to what you get in a hospital setting because those people are very specifically trained the setting is made to ensure that families and the, the people who are ill are looked after in a very specific way so i don't think that you can even compare if these people end up in the health service, they're not going to get that same. No, and, and, and we do recognise that, you know, when the, the, the issue was made in regards to the £84,000 for the children's hospital, that's why you know, we did move to, to reinstate that. But I think, as, as, as the committee recognised and as the assembly recognised and as the children's hospital recognised, it didn't allow them to fully redress uh, what they wanted to do. 
we do value and work in partnership with all our hospice providers. You mentioned a number of them, Linda. And that's why during COVID, both myself and the finance minister at that time, Conor Murphy, actually put additional monies into hospice because we we realised that not only what we were able to supply uh, financially wasn't being matched because there was no fundraising going on at that stage. So we, we gave them that support. Uh, I... I, I I wouldn't want to commit, but if I can find monies towards the end of this year, hospices are one of those areas. I'm not making any commitments, I'm not making any promises, because I don't know if I'll have money left, but I, I do value, and that's the point you make in regards to the challenges in regards to fundraising, and that goes back to my opening comments, Chair, in regards to the financial situation we all find ourselves in, because any organisation that relies on fundraising is also getting it tight no matter where they are across the board. I appreciate that, Minister, and I think you're right not to make false promises, but to at least give some hope that if, if should money become available, that, that those conversations will happen. I think it's really important. So I suppose from my own perspective, um, some of the areas that I would, I would like to ask a few questions on, we know that, and you've said it yourself, primary care and, and social care are going to be a priority for you. So from the, the social care aspect of it, you know what? What is the plan? How are we going to to really? And, and we had the, the all of the trust executives here in front of us a couple of weeks ago. And every one of them said that the most important thing for them, without exception, was dealing with the care packages and that ability to release people from the hospital setting into their own homes, wherever that home should be, whether it's in a, a, a nursing home, residential care home, or in their own home. So I think, can we get some sense of what the plan is? And I understand all of what you said about having to stabilise things. I, I get that. But we aren't going to stabilise anything in the hospitals without dealing with how we're going to get people out of the hospitals and, even more importantly, how we're going to keep them from going into hospital in the first place. And I think that, and that's why I've identified that as one of my priorities, primary care and then social care in regards to that. Uh, Fully aware in, in regards to the pressures that domiciliary care uh, is facing, and that's why uh, before I left uh, this post the last time, I set up that collaborative work forum, which brings together the providers, uh, our trade unions, trusts, uh, and ourselves in regards to what we can currently look at to increase packages. We were able to increase the the, uh, the regional rate uh, to 1854 an hour, and there is some provision that will be paid at higher rates depending on the level of care that is provided, but it's actually getting people into the workforce. So it's how we, we support them, in, not just in a career pathway, but also give them value and make them feel valued. And we do that by that recognition, not just in the pay packet, by, but by acknowledging the work they do is so critical to what we're, we're, we're trying to achieve as well. So the longer term work is actually about a reform model of domiciliary care. What I would like to see, and I think what the forum's looking at, is moving away from what in the past has been a time and task approach, actually to that outcome delivery model. Now that will ultimately be more expensive to deliver as we have to pay more people to do it, so the challenge comes in recruitment, but it provides a quality of service. So in regards to to, to, to where we, we currently sit, our biggest problem with packages is actually being able to provide people to supply them. So it's about getting them into the workforce, uh, and that's a challenge that we face. Um, it was a challenge that we face in, in health and social care in regards to to domiciliary care. So it is about how we work across the forum to make sure that pay and terms and conditions are recognised, but there's also that opportunity to to progress in a career pathway if they want to as well. Okay, I, I suppose we look forward to seeing some of that those plans coming forward. I think it's really important because. You know, all of this sounds good. It sounds exactly what I want to hear, but it's actually seeing how we're going to do it, how we're going to. And I think it's the same as the conversation we had last week. How we're actually going to see this working out. Just my final question, if it's okay, Chair, because I'm conscious that other people is on the the children's services, um, and we are going to be having, uh, I think, specific section of our meeting next week dedicated to this but for me we know that children's services is at this moment in time I don't think you can use any other word other than a complete disaster and um, we are not servicing families well we are not keeping families together we are not preventing children from going into care we are not doing enough to support families so it's 
what is the plan? I know we have to deal with all of the other stuff when children do go into care and how we then support them and their families and anybody else that mm-hmm. has to care for them. But what are, what are we doing to prevent them from ending up in care in the first place? What are we doing to keep families together, to put those support services? I mean, there are some really brilliant organisations out there doing fantastic work, but they're doing it in spite of the challenges, not because of any support they're getting. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering what what are we going to do going forward? Is there, is there something going to be coming forward out of Ray Jones' recommendations, or, or what is the plan? Well, well look, uh, I think Ray Jones's recommendations, and again, that's why I commissioned Ray to look at that over larger piece of of children's uh, and social services in regards to what we can do. But it's what we can do together. I actually met well met the, with the, the justice minister this this morning on another issue, but the conversation came round to. Ray Jones about how ourselves and justice can work together, how ourselves justice communities can work together, how ourselves justice communities and education can actually work together. So there's a larger piece uh, around children's services in general. And I think looking to the Ray Jones piece of work, especially around the the engagement piece that um, he did in in finalising his report and coming forward with those recommendations, is about how Northern Ireland is of a size that we could do this together, right, and start to break down the different silos that we have, looking at different parts of children's social services or just children's services, because we all want to gain the same the same output. So Ray Jones's uh, independent review, we're currently working through the consultation responses from that with 134, uh, and we hope to have worked our way through them in the next in, in the next month to six weeks. In regards to where we go with that, but that's it sets a direction of travel, but it's a longer term piece in regards to what we need to do. <coughs> the here and now is how we m- make best use of that working that we currently have between, as I say, ourselves and those other departments, especially justice and education. I appreciate that, and I think I mean, it was a conversation we had. The, the other important element of it is, and I'm sure you, you won't ignore this given the, the efforts that Radio <coughs> has to ensure this happened, is engaging with the organisations that support mm-hmm. those children and the children themselves and young people because they have an awful lot to offer and an awful lot that they can input into this more than anybody else, probably. No, and, and I think that's the valid point. I think it's the valid point that came out of Ray's work was just how he, how how deeply he engaged, and how much um, I think even talking to the young people when the report was published, how much they saw their input actually into what he produced as well. But you know, of those fifty three recommendations, there's some of them again which will be will be cross cutting across all departments, and something that I need the executive to take on board to be able to progress to it, I think it's full outcome and what it can actually achieve. Thank you, yeah. Chair. Leah. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Robin, um, for the the briefing um, today. So, um, okay, two questions from me. My first question is around if you have any update on the implementation of the Regional Mental Health Crisis Service and where, where that's sitting. Um, and also how you maybe in terms of the, the longer term 10 year mental health strategy, does the department have any plans on how they can engage and involve and incorporate our community and voluntary sector in terms of the rollout of particularly the, the regional um, mental health crisis service? We met with a group during the week, the Well, um, from the Kilkeel area, and like they're, they're, they're literally saving people's lives. When people are in crisis, this local community group are calling out to their homes de-escalating the crisis there and then. They're doing brilliant work around um, mental health crisis and suicide prevention. And there's a community navigators pilot project in the Belfast Trust. Again, it's helping the pressures with the, the staff down in the emergency departments. And it's helping people who are, who are presenting in crisis. Um, so I know that that work's really important around the, that regional service. So if there's any update on the, the rollout of that, and then again, how we can ensure that we're, we will have really, really critical community and voluntary groups that are helping save people's lives, how are we going to ensure that they're part of the rollout of this regional service? Uh, thanks, for Leo. Um, in regard, to t- take your last point for it, and those community navigators that we have, have working, we're actually, um, I don't know if it's been communicated to them yet, we're actually going to extend 
uh, the work they're doing and look, actually evaluate it as a pilot. So we need to keep it in place while they're, do, while they're doing that mm -hmm. uh, because there is an opportunity there, as you say, to roll it out across our other mm -hmm. uh, EDs, especially in regards to the work they're doing. Uh, our, 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 our need and our support of the vulnerable community sector, especially when it came to development of the mental health strategy and the delivery of the, the mental health strategy, is one of partnership because we, we can't do this on our own. We don't have the internal resource. Our trust don't have the resource. GPs uh, don't have that capacity. And, and you know, uh, and as I talked about earlier on, you know, the engagement of community pharmacy as well. But our voluntary community sector who are working on the ground are crucial to this. The challenge that I have goes back to my opening comments in regards to how we can actually support them financially in regards to doing what we need them to do. And I think that focuses around the challenges that I have in budget. I'm not even sure at this point in time that I have a budget uh, looking forward 24, 25 to do what I need to do, never mind what I want to do. But I, I don't want to take away or, or take away any hope or encouragement from our voluntary community sector because they are crucial to what they do. They do fantastic work. And that's why when I had the ability to, um, we established the Mental Health Fund, which was a time specific fund, especially coming out of COVID, where we could ask those organisations actually to step in and do some work. That money won't be there for that continuing work, but it's how we look at other funding streams and again working collaboratively across other departments to see who's funding who for doing what service to make sure it's not just about duplication, but the best <coughs> department or ALB is actually supporting the best organisation to deliver their outcomes rather than having organisations looking for a cocktail of funding across a number of, of pods, so that's again, it's a wider piece of work, but it's something I think as each department finds itself squeezed further financially, that we have to be more more underlinked in regards to what we want to do. Okay, no, well, and before I come on to my second and final question, just in terms of the budget, because I know Bridget very kindly produced some of the stats in the, the correspondence, where we're asking questions around the percentage figure that mental health sitting on, that addictions are sitting on, so we know it's seven percent the yep. mental health spend of the overall budget and addictions is nine percent within within that seven percent. Um again it's just to make the case I know that you are extremely under pressure in terms of your budget, but we really do need to be getting that figure up in terms of our mental health, Robin, or else we'll not be able to do the transformative ten year mental health strategy for Tech Life Two, substance use, do you know, um so but I, I know you're in a difficult position, but again, just to make the play that we can get some additional funding. Yeah. Uh, no, it is about the targets that were actually set in and recognised within the 10-year mental health strategy in regards to you know, moving to that 10% balance fund or comparative funding as well. So, so that's already there in regards to that. But, you know, it's 10% it's of what? You know, the, and again, I don't mean to keep repeating this. It sounds like a broken record, but... I. I I, I need a decent budget for 24, 25 to be able to do the things that, that I want to do, and that's, that's going to be the challenging situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, my, my final question then is just around the recent outbreak of the measles and the whooping cough. So um, I know that the PHA already have done a wee bit of work. I know that there, there has been some publicity um, done around it in terms of um, raising awareness, but especially around the whooping cough, some of them stats were really worrying that it jumped from two cases within the past two years, this year it's up to 72 already, so um, the question is just around what plans does the department have in place to try and make sure that we're getting the handle of them outbreaks? It, it is, and we're going to, it's working through the PHA and their, their contact tracing again through, uh, if necessary, in regards to that, especially, uh, sorry, going back through measles, we had a case uh, where a case was actually identified from a flight coming in to, from Abu Dhabi that landed in Dublin. And again, both public health agencies have been able to work. Uh, we've been able to share passenger manifest uh, yesterday so that any Northern Ireland resident travellers who were on that flight will be contacted or have been contacted by PHA to make sure that they're aware of you know the challenges that may be there, but also the, where they should go for uh, support, vaccines, or the phone number to call the PHA. We put out a, or the PHA put out an, an all-points notice uh, I think last night, but now we have the manifest which is going to be more targeted. In regards for whooping cough, uh, measles, all the rest, it is about vaccine uptake. Mm -hmm. It's about engaging with uh, a younger cohort of parents and convincing them of the benefits 
of vaccination for young children, especially in regards to to measles, whooping cough, rubella, you know, all those things that you know, I was going, to, you know, our generation took for for, for granted in regards to protecting them, in regards to making sure the children got them as well. So it's about that re-engagement piece, it's about that reassurance piece, and it's about engaging with family GPs to make sure that they're they're not aware, but they're making the best opportunities of delivering those as well. So publication, education. Uh, promotion, I think, is where we currently are. Thank you, and hopefully the public listen to the public health messages around the vaccinations for babies and <coughs> kids, rather than sometimes rumour on social media, because I think that's part of the problem, why the levels are dropping. Thanks very much. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Minister. Um, I think everyone in this committee knows and understands the difficulties uh, with the budget, with health, um, and we do wish you well, and I do think we want to have a really positive um, working um, relationship uh, with the department in, in these issues. That said, me being me, I know that you expect me to ask you some questions. So um, I'm going to start with uh, just two or three random ones, which are, 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 are more random. Um, a quick flick through the European the Council website this morning, told me that um, the regulation on mercury had been finalised and um, that the trialogue had taken place between the Commission, the Council and the European Parliament. Um, so this is, in fact, finalised and that's it there. So it is, it is really important that we get to grips with the impact of that for dentistry in Northern Ireland. And the, the, the representatives of the dentistry sent in a, a, a briefing paper um, today. And I just read you because I do think it is really important. An amalgam ban, if directly applied here, will have an irreparable and long lasting damage to provision of dental services, not least at a time when health service dentistry is on its knees. Have, has the department done any work in costing what the ban will cost to Northern Ireland dentists and how you are going to bridge that gap? So that's the first part of it. And the second part, have you sought any um, conversations um, with uh, the departments uh, in London so that there can be some conversation around this at the Joint Committee? Um, and, and the risks and costs to Northern Ireland. Um, in regards, and I'll thank you for if you can share that document with us. On the website. I, I would just, I, we'll, we'll pick that up. In regards to, to those specific costs, we have, as I said, I think in regards to the answer to the chair, we have started that internal work in regards to, because we are uh, aware that there is uh, as a 5%, or sorry, a five times cost in regards to what dentists will have to use uh, and replace to the amalgam as well so that work has has commenced in regards to engagement with um, I, I suppose the joint committee as I said earlier on or, or lead still is with uh, or, or lead still is with uh, okay an additional cost to implement the, the legal authorised Windsor framework relates to article 2 uh, and general dental service the prohibition of amalgam films from January 2025 has been costed at a region of £236,000. That's what it will, will Although We should cost. stress that was, I know those figures have been updated more recently, so they've been revised, but um, we have been, um, as part of the budget process, we put forward a bid um, to the Department of Finance under the Windsor framework. Um, mm -hmm. We've been invited to put bids forward for additional costs of the Windsor framework and the outworkings of, of that, and, and that um, is one of the bids that we've put forward. As I say, that was the figure we had at the time. I know that, that we've recently, I think as recently as early this week, Minister, you cleared a further update on those figures, so, so that number may be out of date, but we certainly have. That's the region of the sort of general ballpark. Yeah, that's the, yeah. We can get you that updated figure that's now great. as well. Thank you. Um, sorry, so just a, a few others. One, um, Yesterday, NHS England announced that it was going to stop um, the use of puberty blockers 
um, for young uh, children. They said that there was not enough evidence to support the safety or the clinical effectiveness of them. Do you intend to follow that um, decision? Yes. That's excellent. That's sharp and to the point. Um, and I hope as, as quickly as possible. I suppose the, the other one then, um, the, sorry, I've just these are require just very quick answers. Um, the other one then is there has been a compensation scheme for uh, mesh damaged women in the rest of the United Kingdom. Will we be looking forward at bringing a similar scheme to Northern Ireland? I think in regards to that, it's not a similar scheme. I think we want to be part of the same scheme in right, regards okay. to what is actually coming forward as well. I looked at Bridget just in regards. Do don't know. Have any yeah. additional details? Yeah, I think Sorry, the answer no is yeah, we're aware of the scheme. Uh, we're in contact with officials in, in England and understand the nature of the scheme. For us, there's two elements to it. First of all, understanding what the finalised scheme will be, because it's still a work in progress. Secondly, is understanding the quantum and potential impact in Northern Ireland. And thirdly, is the best way of implementing it. And as the Minister says, that may well be through trying to extend or be part of the UK scheme or mirror the scheme here, but we're very much aware of the proposals and developments. It sounds like sure. a very long process, Jim. Uh, um, we will and, we'll, and, we'll, we'll we'll endeavour really to make the progress as, yeah. as quick as we as quick yeah. as we can and as um, similar and at similar pace and similar um, quantum. But it is something that we would need to we have to devote our own resources to to understand the nature of the scheme in England. But we've, our officials have been in, in initial contact with DHSC officials and are in part of that debate. So um, just two, two very quick things to, to finish. Um, I could talk about the budget, but maybe others are going to do that. So um, number one, you, and thank you for agreeing to meet the group um, from the Southern Trust area, the ladies with letters. Um, they are looking forward uh, to meeting you. I was with them the other night. Um, if you don't know this figure, it's fine if somebody will just even write to, to the committee about it. I'd just like to know how many serious adverse incidents there have been across all of the trusts of women whose smears have been missed and they have gone on to develop uh, cancer. I don't have that with me, Diane. No, that's, will, that, that's a very important you. one. Yeah. And finally, I, I just wanted to know, I, would, I remember a briefing on this uh, in the last uh, mandate generally to parties um, on the issue of a duty of candour for um, staff, could you maybe just update us on where that particular piece of work is? We, we have a, a wider piece of work ongoing um, currently in regards to a, a structural framework over candour, SAI reform and all those, structure, all those strands of work that we were pulling together under that. Uh, that should be a response. I don't know. I'm, I'm looking to. Honestly, <laughs> 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 we'll, hope, we'll hope to publish a framework. Um, we've been working on a framework on open and just culture, which was part of the, if you like, the duty of candour is the legislative end of it. But really, once we concluded the consultation, that it clearly was pointing to actually the culture is more important, as, as important as the duty. So we've done a lot of work on developing an open and just culture framework. Um, that's near the final stages of development and we hope to be in a position to go out to consult on that fairly shortly and publish that framework and that, but that's part of that whole gamut of patient safety and openness uh, and, and duty of candour so it's all forms part of that process. Thanks Jim, so that is it's, it's the wider overarching <coughs> Diane for me bringing SAI, <coughs> the review of SAI's recommendations from RHD, uh, neurology, all the inquiries that we have, currently have on running on duty of candour all together under one piece of work so that not, we're not continuing any, either out to consultation or back out to the workforce continually that with makes sense. different strands. So. Okay. Thank you. Colin? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister. Welcome back to the Health Committee and welcome back to your role as Health Minister for a few months. Um, just in terms of the service, we can get lost in a lot of detail here. But community pharmacy is short of money, dentists are short of money, domiciliary care is under pressure, nursing homes are waiting in the wings in terms of their funding models and they've been too short, the waiting lists are getting longer and longer, the pay for nurses was short but so did for this year, uh, junior doctors, other doctors short, then there's next year, GPs are struggling to deliver their services, the MDT rollout has stalled. Consultants are eyeing up jobs in other jurisdictions because the pay is much bigger. 
There's no resolution to safe working legislation. The mental health strategy is short of money. The cancer strategy is short of money. And the community and voluntary sector funding has decimated much of them. I mean, the system, if it's not at collapse and in the process of collapsing, it is mighty, mighty close to it. And we can talk about our individual issues and our individual bits and pieces and where the work has been done. And your staff must be pushed to the extreme of trying to be able to keep the ship afloat, as you referenced earlier. But we need to see a high-level plan that is actually going to allow us to examine that plan to see where it is that we're going to go overall rather than a specific plan here and there. Because I know if I write to you about an issue, you're going to come back and tell me that you don't have the money. So is there a point where we need to make this a wider executive conversation so that it's not just you as the health minister sitting there with not the right amount of money to deliver the service that is needed? And how do we get to that point? Because there's no point in us just spending the next three or four years writing to you uh, or whoever's the health minister for them to write back and say that they don't have the money. Because what needs to happen is that the executive needs to take decisions and those decisions then have to be held to account one way or other. There'll be some are supported. There'll be some decisions that won't be supported. But the sector out there needs to know. And I think it's unfair that every time that we complain about an issue, we are accused of complaining because, of course, we're going to complain because right across the whole board, just about every facet of the health service is short of funding. And it's going to have to get to the point. The logical conclusion is that we fund a number of the services and then there's a restriction and cutback on others. That's what political decisions have to be taken in any other democratic place. Are we going to get to that stage, do you think? Oh, yes, we will. Because I think when you go back to the point about the executive uh, making those decisions, as about where I sit now at this minute in time, and I've, I've been very clear, you know, I need an additional one billion on top of what I currently have. We've, we've been asked to, and we're, we're taking forward a, a projection of service on a flat cash basis. What that means is we're looking at what we were given last year on a flat cash basis and trying to map that into next year's services. We're in the, I suppose, the insidious position that we're sitting now two to three weeks out of the end of this financial year with a budget process that hasn't started. Normally, as you're well aware, all members around here as well, Normally, at this point in time, we would know what our budget is next year rather than having to look to see what it may be. I'm still in the situation, as is every other minister, waiting to see what that allocation will be for 24-25. When I say I need a, a billion pounds, and, and to break that down, Chair, into I suppose, three, three specific uh, points, three specific uh, blocks, um, 300 million um, will be a recurrent uh, consequence of this years pay negotiations and uplifts as well. So as I said when in my opening statements, you know, a pay award just isn't for when we come in through the door. So what I've committed to this year in regard to Agenda for Change, DDRB and all those other associated, that's three hundred pounds knock on effect. I then have an additional five hundred and fifty million in regards to those additional pressures that health always gets face one. So health inflation always sets that bit higher than other inflation and that's due Due to those pressures arising from non-pay inflation, so demand and growth, as I said earlier, we have an ageing population, <coughs> higher costs of drugs, uh, again, unavoidable increases in areas such as th those things that we have to pay, holiday pay, employer pension contributions, and the recognition that, unfortunately, uh, because of a large amount of our workforce is on the national living wage, when that goes up, we have additional pressures there as well. So, uh, and that takes us you know, to the additional point that even within that, there's $150 million that we're estimating to start uh, to look at the pay lift that we will expect it to fund in 24-25. So that is not about doing anything additional. That's not about doing anything new. That's about the standstill period that we actually find ourselves in. So when I sit here as, as health minister, and when, uh, as, as you're aware, as you're all fully aware, when I make that approach, when I have those negotiations with the finance minister and putting forward our case, it will be a very challenging position. Uh, and look at it, and I, I've said this, um, I have a challenging job. 
finance minister in Northern Ireland in the next four to five weeks will be as equally challenging because it, she's going to have to make the call. That will go to the executive. The executive will then decide if those allocations are just and fair um, in regards to what we have to do at that point. And I think, as you say this, we have to then look at what are we going to do with the money that we've been provided with. Uh, do we look towards some of those pieces that I've said are transformational in regards to additional funding in primary <coughs> care or social care? If I do, without additional money to do that, where do I take it from? When I look to what was promised of the, of the £3.3 billion, there's £49 million pound per year transformational funding. I could spend that day in, day out in regards to what I want to do in health to transform. I, I hear a lot of you know, people talk about Bangoa. Bangoa was very clear for transformation it needed a ring-fenced transformational budget to set aside the op operational budget. So it's not about transforming with the small pot you have. It's been given resource to transform. So when that £49 million is there as transformational money, it's how we bid into that as well. And the additional 800, I think the, the executive has indicated an additional 850 million on top of what we had last year. I'm saying I need a billion of it. You know, so that's the real life pressures that we're doing to stand still. So when I say we look to efficiencies, efficiencies aren't going to make the cost saving that we need. And I noticed, you know, from, from reading transcripts this morning, that was the same message that the finance minister and the permanent secretary in the Department of Finance told the finance committee yesterday. You know, we can tighten our belts so far, but at that point when we have to say, look, this is something we're going to have to stop, as Chris has said, it's not because we want to stop it, it's because we can no longer make it viable. Our, at, at that point when we see that budget, that's the point we're going to have to come back, and that's the point that we'll have those real discussions with this committee, and that's where, when I said earlier on in regards to parties, individuals voting through a budget and then asking me to spend more. I think people need to be realistic in regards to the budget that you allocate to the Department of Health is what the budget the Department of Health has to spend. So there has to be an expectation in regards to what you get for your money. To just a final comment, I, I, I agree with you 100% there because if you don't get that full billion pounds from the executive, Every single one of those issues that I've read out and every single issue that members have mentioned here are not going to change. Not substantially. There may be a tweak to the edge, but there's going to be no substantial change if there isn't any cash to actually deliver that work. And I think it's a fair point. We will have to observe who is complaining about the lack of spending if they've gone through the lobbies to give you a budget that doesn't give you the money to do anything. And I will also chair just in saying that in regards to the opposition and the funding, in regards to the amendments that they bring forward to budget proposals from the executive as well, in regards to that a bit where we can look uh, to see what the opposition will be doing when it comes to health as well. I know what other commitments other parties have made in regards to to that that additional billion. So there, there'll be, a, I think, a large expectation. And, and chair, that's why I said in my opening comments about 24, 25, because of the financial period about being a year of, of stability of doing what we can. When I was in this post before, and I don't think there's a member or a party around this table, agreed that the thing that health needed was a recurrent budget so that we could see the changes that we were making were actually for the long term rather than for a six month funding period because that's the money and we didn't know we were going to have it in the 1st of April next year. So that recur recurring budget is important to us uh, as much as the size we get. The size of the budget is vital, but a recurrent gives us the stability to do the work we want to do. I think we had an opportunity for that, unfortunately, in 22, but didn't, it didn't happen. Um, Alan Chambers. Oh, thank you. Uh, Minister, normally when a politician takes up office, the, the media uh, wait for 100 days before they uh, will write their performance pieces. Um, you've only been five to six weeks uh, in office, although it maybe feels like 100 days. Uh, but political expectations across the Assembly, probably from day one, uh, are growing, uh, and that's evident by the, your AQW post bag. Uh, so maybe we all need to just step back and take a more re realistic approach to our expectations. But I'm reassured by your comments that improvements are doable. 
mean, that's what we all aspire to in here. Uh, but we have to recognise it may be a long-term journey, and certainly I believe that future multi-year budgets um, will get us to our destination uh, an awful lot quicker. But just three questions, uh, Minister, around funding. Uh, one, how important is it for you to receive clarity on next year's funding comment? Uh, out, sorry, funding outcome. Uh, two, uh, <coughs> what difference would it mean in terms of impact receiving that clarity early in financial year compared to, compared to later in the year? And lastly, if you're kept waiting for clarity, what will be the impact on the delivery and scale of, say, the waiting list initiative? Um, you know, I thank the member for his for his comments and his, his questions as well. In in regards to, uh, and I suppose it is a bit looking about what we've been we've been able to do um, in the meantime, even with the pressures we've been under, and and the finance pressures where we've looked at what we can do in a service point of view. You know, we've established those two dedicated day procedure centres, Lagan Valley and Oma, three elective overnight stay centres at Daisy Hill, Matter South West, an expansion of our post anaesthetic care unit beds, two rapid diagnostic centres at White Abbey, South Tyrone, uh, and those service reviews that we have ongoing as well. So there are those small pieces that we've been able to do, but they're not on the wider scale in regards to, to what we need to do. And that's where the challenge of not having that recurrent budget that the member asks about. So when we're making those small changes uh, in regards to establishing those sites, we could do more if we knew the funding was going to be there next year, following year, because it also gives staff the reassurance to make those transitions into new roles, that the new service that we're establishing is going to be there, the pathways can actually be established and secured for who's going into it, when they're getting access to it and the rest of it. So the planning round um, a, another one year budget and as I said as I said to Colin not knowing now uh, what we're going to have on the 1st of April if we don't get a budget to June, maybe even September and we find out our budget is dramatically short from what we've spent on, the, the actions that we have to take at that point to balance our book is more dramatic. So the sooner we have an indication of what we can do and what we have, uh, the less the less I'm, I'm not gonna, the less impactful some of the decisions will be. Whereas if you're waiting to the last quarter and have to make significant budgetary cuts or amendments, it has more of an impact onto what we're actually doing. In regards to waiting lists, um, at this moment in time, I don't have additionality for waiting list initiatives. It was indicated in the, I, I suppose, the package that was presented by government at the start of the year, there'd be £34 million for a waiting list initiative. Um, I've asked for it. Uh, as of yet, I haven't received it. So the challenge is, come the 1st of April, on those that £34 million, do I spend it uh, thinking that's the only waiting list initiative money I'm going to get for 12 months? Or do I spend it as it's additional? to the 138 that have actually asked the executive. So without that clarity, it leaves me at, a, I suppose, a, a disadvantage as to what we can actually plan and go forward with. So it all depends on when we see what the financial package will be, when we know what it's going to be that actually starts to shape, I think, the plans that Colin was talking about as to what we have to do. Yeah. Well, Minister, there's been a lot of collective noise around uh, a collegiate uh, uh, approach to, to health and health funding. Uh, I certainly hope that all those promises fall into place. What are you? Thank you, Dali. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thanks, Minister, for coming today. We've hit on quite a lot of topics already that I'd wanted to talk about, so um, thank you for your answers to those. Um, a couple of questions. I, I just wanted to start by saying one of the things I've noticed over the last couple of years is the morale in the health, health service. Since COVID, we have had a decrease in morale. People do feel undervalued, overworked, uh, strained. We're getting more and more burnouts. We're getting people leaving the profession to go to other jurisdictions and, and to go to um, other professions. People aren't being attracted into nursing or even medicine now. You know, um, we are have an issue with retaining our own staff as well. Um, I think I welcome your... Um, 
priority on transformation, absolutely, and you know we completely agree that that's something that we have to do. But you cannot transform the system without the staff. Um, you need to keep the staff in the system. Um, I think to go back to your analogy, a, a ship needs sailors, so absolutely you need to be um, keeping that together. Just to go through a couple of things, I was going to go through a duty of candour. I think that's been raised by Diana already. I'm glad to see that that was um, mentioned. The GP contracts, the handbags, we're seeing increased um, amounts of GPs not being able to uh, deliver services and hand them back their contracts. I know you're aware of a situation in Glenarm a couple of years ago um, and how that has progressed and impacted in the East Andrum area. Um, we are seeing further ones, and I know there's. Uh, I understand there's other GP services under extreme pressures at the minute. So I'd like to hear just how you're um, going to support struggling GP practices to prevent them from uh, having to hand back their contracts. Safe staffing is something that, um, as a nurse, my background, uh, uh, incredibly important to staff right across the system. But certainly, you know, nurses are very, very keen to see this. Um, it is part of the one of the asks that. Um, they've had during industrial action and things like that. Um, certainly nurses want to deliver safe and effective care. Uh, it's something that's very, very stressful for um, people working within the health service who feel that they can't deliver due to the burdens that are put on them, safe and effective care, and they're not being able to deliver for their patients. And that is impacting <coughs> people's stress, people's health, uh, and encouraging people to leave the profession, sadly. Um, so I, I would like to hear about the progression of or your plans to progress um, a safe staffing bill and I'm sure you're aware of recent concerns that were raised uh, within the Belfast Trust um, just over the last couple of days just about pressures inside the system, patients being treated in corridors and, uh, and things like that. Um, now this happens everywhere, you know, um, and more and more so over the last few years we have seen constant pressures, they used to be known as winter pressures as I'm sure you're very aware, they're not winter pressures anymore, they are absolutely all year pressures um, and we have corridor beds throughout the years and we have pressures in A&E throughout the years as well. Um, just to go back to A&E uh, &E as well, I know you attended the Royal College of Emergency Medicine um, event, I think it was two weeks ago. Um, now we have seen a huge increase in patients waiting longer than 12 hours and 24 hours within our health service or within our A&E departments. Um, it is something that should never happen. You know, patients should wait longer than, than 12 hours um, and certainly not ever uh, 24 hours. In September 2016, seven people waited for longer than 24 hours uh, and in September 2023, the number was uh, 3,927. So there has been a huge increase in 12 hour and 24 hour waits within our departments. Um, and this obviously puts pressure on ambulance services as well uh, and pressures throughout the system. So I just wanted to hear what, what your plans for reducing pressures within inside, specifically within inside um, emergency departments, and how that would help ease pressures on, on the <coughs> system then as well. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go. <laughs> okay. Um, S safe staffing, um, I, I, I'll, I'll make, make a start there, Donnie, in regards to that. I do hope to progress that bill um, this year in regards to that. I've, uh, my department officials uh, have had very good engagement with all their trade union side in regards to that. Um, it was one of the topics we discussed with RCN when I met them yesterday, um, nips of the day before as well in regards to where that actually looks like. I hope to have that ready to go to consultation by the end of this year in regards because it is quite a comprehensive piece of work but we've done a co-production, co-design with our with our trade union side as well because it's important that it's not something that's imposed on them but something that's worked in partnership with them in regards so there's an understanding of, of what that actually means. In regards to just going through some some of your your, your points there and you can pick uh, you, you can remind me if I'm missing in, in regards to uh, the pressures in emergency uh, emergency departments and those length of stays. Again, that goes back to, I suppose, my um, initial points in regards to priorities in primary and domiciliary care. Because if people are being treated in the community and then supported in the community, it means our flow through hospital is a lot easier. Why, and why we're seeing those, I suppose, numbers and long stays within our ED departments is because we don't have that flow of patients continually going through our system to get them 
both prevent them coming into EDs by being seen in GPs, but also getting them out of the <coughs> hospital setting through support by domiciliary care packages. Uh, we, sorry, I did commission a GERF report in regards to urgent and emergency uh, care just before I left. That will be due to publish its recommendations yep. again shortly. One of the things that I, I think I find useful using GERF is it is about bringing in uh, system specialists that know what they're talking about. Where we've brought them in before have come out with recommendations um, that have been um, pointed out the difficulties that we already knew, but because we used professionals to do it, they also gave us solutions as well. So the likes of the GERF report on orthopaedics has made a massive change. Urology as well will set a direction of travel for us. So I'm hopeful that GERF, in regards to their view of urgent emergency care, starts to, to show us some, some way in how we manage uh, our patients in their emergency and, and also flow as well, but making sure that we have an information system that people know where where to go to, should it be an ambulatory uh, minor injuries unit and not urgent emergency care isn't always the right avenue to, to go to as well, but unfortunately that's where a lot of people see the front door of the health service and that's where they're, where they're going now. So it's about how we use those other, other avenues as well. Uh, staff morale, um, I, I agree with you in regards to, to where we currently are. Engaging with staff, I think the biggest impact that they had was a year and a half of this place not being here to listen to them and engage with them. And that has had uh, serious serious implications because the frustrations uh, that they've had within the system, within their own support networks, they didn't have that avenue to access uh, decision makers. They were able to talk to departmental officials and engage with work programmes that were already started, but where they saw that change. I'm not saying us being back here has seen every healthcare worker celebrate in regards to wh where they are now, <coughs> but it shows them that there is somebody willing to engage in support through yourselves as a health committee, through their local MLAs, but also through having a, a minister back as well, because then you know, having that local accountability, we were able to look at the pay reviews that you know, our Secretary <coughs> of State wasn't willing to do uh, when there was no assembly. So those small things make a difference. We'll not, we'll not sort them all overnight, but we need to make sure that we're providing a service that they feel they're safe working in. And I think that's where the bonus of the safe staffing legislation will actually come forward with union support and union buy-in as well. Contract handbags in, in GPs has been um, an ongoing issue in regards to, to where we currently are. Uh, at this point, um, we haven't seen a GP practice close, and I think that's important in regards to when it comes to people talking about contracts being handed back, doesn't mean they've shut down. In a number of cases, we've seen other GPs step in and take that contract on. We've seen GP federations step in and through uh, other models taking over the running of a practice. Or in the extremity, we've seen trusts stepping in to make sure that GP practice continues to function in the location it, as it has. What we have seen in regards to when one GP hands its contract back uh, for legitimate reasons, for legitimate current concerns, it has an uns a, a destabilising effect on some of the GP practices around because there is, a, I suppose, a fear that if that practice was to fold, that they would end up picking up all the, the patients that were going to be transferred across. So there is a piece of work, again, going through uh, my department at the minute in regards to officials engaging with uh, GPs actually as to what the contract looks like and how we work our way around to actually making it a better contract for 24-25. One of the things, and it goes back to points that the members have raised, um, we don't see contracts being handed back in the same numbers where we have multidisciplinary teams. So it is about how we finance and staff our multidisciplinary team model. It's always something I've believed in as you know how we support our GP practice, but also how we support a wider health provision closer to people at home. And that's what, what I, I continue to do and I've, I've asked officials to look at. Um, what a mess. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Nuala. Oh, um, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Um, I've got a couple of supplementaries to um, questions that were asked, so I'll start off with those. Um, and the first is on the junior doctor um, talks that you said, and, and I noticed um, a tweet from the junior doctor committee that, that there has been an offer to enter talks, but I just wonder if you could clarify whether that's negotiations, and if it is, and um, the latter, whether money has been found for, for such. Um, I haven't seen the tweet. I have received an update from officials that they're coming back in to engage about 24, 25 pay. Um, I, I would hope to have a wider conversation when we do get them in, but we haven't finalised the terms of that meeting yet, Nullis, in regards to what exactly it is. But I'm, I, I look, I, I'm just at a stage where we're back talking again, negotiating again uh, in regards to how we take that back, because they are a crucial part of our workforce that I do want to support and make sure there is. Uh, a mechanism there that we support because one of the issues that they did raise as well and I think it was raised in the in the chamber I think it was Linda raised it was about the conditions they actually work in so it's not just about the pay it's about how they're treated staff rooms they have access to as well so there's other pieces of work that I think we can engage with them as um, well Thank you um, although it's my understanding um, from those that currently sit in the committee those that have been on the committee before and various organisations that um, previous health ministers, including yourself, have already engaged on working conditions and it's already been put to the department many times what those conditions are and that they have not yet been changed or agreed to. So I just think it's really important that we don't raise expectations where we're not going to deliver. It's not always about um, resourcing and financing, but it's about listening to and then actually actioning those. So I think it's important that if you're going to commit to talking about working conditions, again, that you actually implement those changes and as for the pay negotiations, um, I think it's important not to kind of raise the expectations. No, and I think that has never been something I've mm -hmm. I've done in regards to raising expectations in regards to any negotiation or even coming into this committee in regards to raising expectations under what I believe we can currently deliver. Um, um, thank you, and that, and I look forward to hearing that and how that goes after the first two weeks. My other question was a supplementary around the surgical hubs. Um, and we have had we had in committee last week uh, a brief update with Garden how they they are doing, um, and and we are hearing from a number of, of health professionals that they are progressing well. So just want to ask if you feel that, that the outputs are as high as that they could be, um, for etc. Do do you have enough um, ring fence beds, workers, and resources? Is there enough elective surgery taking place in those um, versus in other hospitals that should be focusing on? on other non-elective or um, specialised procedures? And, and I think that was one of the things, well, it actually came out of Bengoa, but we all we really saw it through COVID as well, where we tried to establish those, what we call green sites, were the ones where they were actually looking at their elective surgeries as well. Uh, so when we look at what we have been able to produce, I think, in that short space of time, you know, as I said earlier, those two dedicated day procedures centres at Lagan Valley, Anoma, three elective overnight day centres, Daisy Hill, Matter, South West, Acute. The expansion of, and I mentioned them earlier on, but, but I think it's a, it's a crucial piece of this is their post anaesthetic care unit beds. So those PAGU beds are where a patient can have an operation, whereas previously we'd have been putting them into ICU or intensive care. It's actually the form of support that they need. Which allows you know from the, from the work that actually was done by Professor Mark Taylor in promoting those, and again looking for our three speciality centres for cataracts, you know, down south through and mid Ulster, uh, and again the, the orthopaedics that we now have at Duke of Connaught uh, day procedure unit as well. So it is about how we start. Those small units are now in place, but it's how we actually expand capacity. And when I said earlier on about the, the blueprint review that I'm looking at at the hospitals, is how we identified what we're currently doing in them uh, as a local site, but then how we expand that regionally. As I've said, you know, there's always that line, you know, oh, you're going to close hospitals. I need every square foot of every hospital that I currently have. And that's why even during the last the last term here, we expanded and invested uh, in the Duke of Connaught. Uh, I have other facilities, like the likes of White Abbey, what we invested in, but we don't have a current staffing ratio for it as well. So it's making sure that we have those balances, which I think is, is your point. Um, and I, I do. We are here in, um, in each committee um, each week about the, the staffing issues within um, not just hubs, but across right across the workforce. Um, but it's um, when we come to transformation, and particularly about the surgical hubs, just staying on that, um, it's it's not just about staffing, but it's also about the public. 
Um, and so do you feel that it would be beneficial to um, enter in a, into a communication strategy about saying to the public, look, do you want to get your surgery in this, your closest hospital, in two, three years, or travel a bit further, um, but also engaging with the other departments around that community transport um, needs? Yep. Look, that's a, it's a message I, I've I've put out, and I think it was something, again, going back to your, our times during COVID, one of the, the biggest challenges we had was getting workforce to travel to those sites. We got through that in regards to that. Then we started to get patients who were willing to travel, and again, as, as you point out, it's that identification. You know, are you willing to travel, or do you still want to wait? You know, so there's that level of, of choice that's still in the system. Most people in Northern Ireland are willing to travel. Uh, there's a third cohort where we need to get the message across, and that's to some of uh, our colleagues in the Assembly who still see a removal of a service from a local hospital as a reason to protest and complain rather than looking about how we can best use that hospital as part of a wider strategic form in regards to, to what we need to do to change. Um, no, I, I do agree with your last point, but unfortunately Minister members of your own party um, have often protested when there's been been changes, so it's important that every single party uh, uh, gets and, on, and, on and board. And your, um, your, uh, yours as well, and I, I, I do one, believe. One thing that I but do sorry, just go back to the last point, sorry, the other part didn't finish. I, I have, uh, sorry, before the last month it ended as well, uh, it was myself, John O'Dowd as Infrastructure Minister, and I think Edwin Putz was there as Agriculture Minister, where we were actually looking to see how we could pull uh, what would be technically community transport so that we were making best use of, of all those resources, again, across the three departments, to make sure we were getting people who were willing to travel, actually being supported, to travel as well. And I think that's that's really helpful and, and important for moving forward under transformation, otherwise you know, it won't be successful in the long term. And you mentioned there about the workforce do travel now. Can I ask, is, is there a heavy reliance then on locums, like in particular, um, are there any of the hubs that do you have a heavy reliance on locums, and is that actually using more um, resources than actually the kind of longer term that we'd want to see? I'm not sure. Okay. In regards to that workforce skill, in regards to the utilisation of, of locums, because we have, again, through those transformational pieces, we've tried to stabilise them, make them long term. Uh, investments, but again, the one-year non-recurring budget has challenged. Yeah, I think it is a challenge. I mean, I think you're quite right. I mean, the, the centres we've got are, are up and running. The key is making sure we're using all the lists and making sure we have the staff to run the lists. Primarily, it's about using HSC resource. In fact, almost as far as possible, using HSC resource. So that's either moving uh, and staff moving to those and doing those lists, particularly around consultants, and using a staff mix. So using the staff that are there, plus perhaps a different consultant or else it's being purchased an additionality under waiting list initiatives through the HSC. Um, when you talk about transformation in the future and moving forward, there are things that have to be done to enable it. And I think one of it will be looking at workforce. It's not only the gaps in the workforce, it's looking at um, how much we can lever in a HSC workforce as well as individual trust workforce. So that idea that there's a dual role, both as a trust employee but also part of the HSC workforce. And that are those are some of the messages that are coming through in terms of the blueprint work, actually the physical location stuff is important, but the more important stuff is, you've said, communication and understanding the public's interest and in where they would go for treatment and understanding how that is enabled through the workforce. Um, I think there's lots of challenges around all those areas, but those are the key enablers. It's, it's workforce, it's messaging, and it's actually <coughs> delivering. Um, and I think productivity is one of the things that Minister's mentioned. That is about looking at theatre utilisation, consultant time, across everywhere, not just the elective centres. Um, thank, thank you. I have um, just a, a few more. Is that okay? Uh, can I take Alan please? and then if we have a wee bit of time at the end, because a couple of people have, have asked. Well, can I ask, start asking one? Um, yeah. So I, I, was time, some, I was timing myself. So I'm so timing so everybody. <laughs> <laughs> just to try and get it, make sure everybody gets in, because I am very... It was a, a supplementary, ongoing from what Linda said as well, um, regarding the um, regions report, social services. Um, and you're still considering the recommendations. Um, and it's one of the questions, recommendations, was around this new children's directorate because we understand the resources issue, but um, sometimes like there's a lot of issues around bureaucracy too and how you actually cut through that and make the right decision that the trusts working together 
um, to actually say, okay, who has respite services in one trust, who doesn't have respite services in another. I mean, we need to ensure that we can actually work together because at the minute we're hearing just too many um, negative issues around respite. It's at the worst it's ever been for families who are already struggling. And in particular, I don't know if the minister is aware, maybe the minister can actually update on whether um, uh, the department is still paying for Rainbow Lodge, even though there are no current patients in it for respite services because they're not able to actually get a workforce because it's my understanding maybe it's changed since now that actually it still doesn't have any any um, patients in for respite services but it's still getting 300,000 per year um, as a respite unit but yet people aren't able to actually access it and I think that I don't know if that comes down to trusts not not mm. working with the private organisations that run run um, these respite units or it's because there's not enough um, collaborative work going on but there's something gone wrong there that there's a service that's currently being run and there are no patients in it and haven't been for a number of years so I think it's worth the minister and the team checking out whether that's still, still no, the case. I, I, I'll, I'll check up on those but if I can get back to respond to the committee chair. Okay. Thank you. Alan? Thanks chair. Um, you're very welcome minister. Um, Everybody's pitched their questions today at a very high level, and nobody's took the opportunity to bring their question down a tier. Um, and obviously, Causeway. we know Causeway Hospital. Yep, I'm keen to know. I mean, we've heard for some years now about a vision for Causeway Hospital. We have heard about potential elective hubs and being an elective hub of the North Coast. Um, and we've heard a lot from yourself today, and we've heard from previous speakers who you have presented to this committee about transformation, um, reform. Um, and I'm keen to know at what point will we see that vision for Causeway Hospital? Because not only that vision or that vision will have an impact not only on my constituents, your constituents, but whatever that vision may be, whatever elective hub may be situated there, it will also potentially have impact all of us within this room, all our constituents. So I'm keen to know what point will we see that in place? Because it gives a bit of confidence to the staff that are there, but also I think it will it will also help the health department to attract staff because that's one of the key that we're consistently told that because of varying issues they struggle to attract staff to Causeway. So forgive me for bringing it down to that tier, but I'm never missing an opportunity, Minister. No, no I, I, look, I, I would be remiss if I didn't think you would, because you know you've you've followed on, and your no, don't mean that's in a bad way, but you've followed on your father's footsteps in regards to uh, the representation of the local population in, in East London. There, and he, and he always, any time he spoke to me, it was always about Causeway Hospital in regards to what a fantastic facility it is, and the people who work in it and the service they're providing. In regards to that specific vision, you know, I, I spoke earlier on about that blueprint that we have from, for our hospital service as well. And you'll know, um, and I'm sure you've had the engagements with Jennifer Walsh, the Chief Executive of the Northern Trust. The Northern Trust have, I think, a very, a very ambitious but deliverable vision for Causeway Hospital in regards to the next generation of a surgical hub, but also what they're doing there. I think they just recently opened uh, up an ambulatory unit in regards to how they were supporting the elderly population up there as well. So <coughs> that investment, that dedication of the Causeway is, is one that is shared not just by ourselves in the department, but also the Northern Trust and the Northern Trust board as to how it services, not just the trust itself, but that, as you say, that wider population across the, 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 the north coast as well as well as well sorry. So there is a there is a piece there that we're working in collaboration with Northern Trust in regards to how how that goes forward. Your point about recruitment, I, I do go back, you know, when I was meetings with your father with Tony Stevens when he was chief executive, when recruitment was not just a challenge uh, for Causeway, it was one of the things they just couldn't manage to get anybody there. That has changed dramatically. Uh, in the past couple of years due to the vision that has been supplied because it's, I, I think it goes round how the narrative around Causeway has changed. It used to be that Causeway was always one of those hospitals that seemed to be under threat of closure or was going to close, whereas now it's an integral part of our entire hospital system in regards to what we do and, and, and I appreciate the support that our local elective reps actually give to the Northern Trust management and promoting Causeway as a place 
not just to go, but as a future uh, within our health service and what it can deliver. Not being mischievous in any way when asked this question. I know there's a lot of, you know, we've talked about reform, we've heard it again multiple times today here, but has there been any discussions or any conversations or any thinking about, I mean, we have a single education system, has there been any discussions about a single health system or a single, sorry, a single trust? Well, Alan, as part of the Ulster Unionist Party policy, I'm glad maybe you're moving on to message. I'm not advocating for it, I'm only asking. Is there any? Have we asked that heavily now? <laughs> no, look, look, I'm sorry, I've not meant to be, be, be facetious in any sort of way or, or, or mischievous, I think, as you put it on. I think there is an opportunity in regards to how we look at that more regional approach to some of our services. I think we're starting to see it in mental health. Whereas trusts are breaking down the, the artificial borders that they have within Northern Ireland. So I think there is a greater piece of work in regards to where we look at our acute hospital, uh, that blueprint, about how, how hospitals manage, what services they're delivering, where they're delivering, and actually where their catchment area is as well. So it's maybe not about the step now to a single trust, it's about how our trusts actually work uh, better together. And I'm going to look to Jim because he, he'll remember the term of the five trusts that they have developed as to how they are working together I wish, now. I wish I could, Minister. Um, it's um, <laughs> collab- it's <coughs> provider collaboratives is what they're looking at as a way of it's trying to formalise yeah. arrangements that, you know, there, certainly as we look at the blueprint document, as, as we look at some of the initiatives we've got in terms of elective hubs and we talk about staff moving, we talk about patients moving and we talk about regional services, there's a need to sort of say, well, how do we underpin that with more formal, if you like, arrangements and more formal structures. The trusts themselves are looking at provider collaboratives and recently, just before um, just before Christmas, they produced a collaborative approach to a central control centre to look at urgent care pressures across the system. But there's scope to look at uh, in, in, uh, in other matters. At the same time, as part of the work that's being done in Blueprint, we're looking at um, approaches that have gotten in Scotland where there is um, commitments to and, and almost service level agreements and memorandums of understanding about how trusts and how providers will operate and support each other because if we say there is a network and part of the system is a network as well as an individual trust area then I think it's a point members have made a failure in one part of the network will eventually have a repercussion somewhere else in that network so we are looking at much more formal arrangements to try and cement those collaborative approaches. Um, being around everyone at this stage, Minister, I know that Linda and Neil have indicated just two very quick follow-ups. If I could just maybe conclude on some of the stuff as well, because as the discussion's gone on, some of the issues that I raised um, at the start have come up. But I suppose just, I mean, certainly for me, the message is very clear. If we invest in our workforce and value our workforce, a lot of the issues that we're dealing with here today will hopefully um, be in a much better place. And I think one of the things, and it has been touched on by others, is that we're currently spending quite a lot of money in plugging gaps with the agency and locum staff. So if we can get to a point, which isn't easy, um, of where that won't be needed to the same extent, uh, we'd definitely be in a, in a very different position. And I suppose in addition to that, we talked around transformation and reform and some of what you've talked about. And I'd, I'd met with RCN yesterday as well, following your meeting, and it was... Um, we were talking about the safe staff and legislation and that co-production and co-design is so important to everything we do but also you know if we're le- if it's being led by clinicians by frontline staff who know exactly what they're talking about and know what we're dealing with but also that the wider community i think there's a huge role particularly around unpaid carers i mean who know best for for the loved ones i think that's very important in that piece and then we're working with the community to bring that forward that hopefully we won't be dealing with protests and and people opposing things because a lot of what we have seen in fairness is around service collapse and not transformation because we haven't got to that point yet so i just it was just to make that point but just two very well one very quick point on the dentistry um piece i talked about the the cost service analysis review for community pharmacy have you any plans to do something similar um with dentistry because of of those rising costs we are looking at the general dental service contract in regards to, to where that currently sits and what stage that's at. I, I don't have the, 
half of the yeah, top gem. I mean, we, we, so obviously the focus has been on, we've been looking specifically in 23, 24, and the ministers have made some comments in terms of uh, funding has been made available. We're also looking at the general uplift, um, but members have made points about changes that have happened elsewhere across the UK in terms of approaches to the general dental contracts. I know you heard today about the Scottish contracts. We are looking at those developments that have happened to see, you know, what they might mean, um, you know, the benefits and the impacts they have, and what that might mean for Northern Ireland in terms of trying to stabilise and sustain dental services here. Uh, Chair, Chair, in regards to, to agency staff, again, one of the things that we did was to actually to remove off contract agency yeah. staff. Uh, that has now. We we hope and we estimate towards the end of this financial year we'll actually see our agency bill reduced by twenty million pounds yeah. in regards to what actions have been taken there, as well as those additional staff that we've been able to get in through you know health and social care workforce. So if that figure stays true and we actually see a reduction in our agency spend, um, not only will it be a first for a number of years here in Northern Ireland, we'll be the first across the four nations actually to see the start and reduction in that. One of the things we were able to do also do, and it was an early indicator from Ray Jones' is re report as well, was to remove agency social workers as part of the workforce. We, we did that uh, to an extent that every graduate who came out we were able to offer a place within our health and social care workforce. So it's a challenging piece of work because it takes a, a lot of input from trust management, ward management and trade union side as well. So we were able to do that off contract piece. Uh, I think there's more we can do in regards to agency staff uh, in regards. Uh, if you were meeting with, with RCN as well yesterday, um, the recent pay uplift uh, goes some way to narrow the gap as to what agencies were paying in regards to core core salaries as well. doesn't fully close the gap, but it, it's a piece of work that needs to be ongoing as well. Yeah, and, it's, and that is very positive around agency staff, I'm supposed to declare an interest as a social worker, um, but there are, we have obviously met with the chief executives a number of weeks ago and some of the, the, the figures we were hearing around vacancies in social work teams um, was, was very, very frightening, so um, hopefully we can start to, to fill those vacancies. But just on the locums, I am, you know, the what has been quoted to me is that our spend on locums here is higher than what the cumulative figure for England, Scotland and Wales, so very conscious of that and how if we're able to get a good pay settlement that we can start to, to eliminate some of that. So thank you for that. So of Linda and then Nuala and then that will be us. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it kind of is a follow on from <coughs> what Nuala said, to be honest, and, and it's just reinforcing the point, to be honest with you, around particularly adults, more so in, in my constituency with learned disabilities and the respite care that is in place for them or rather that is not in place for them and it goes back to other points that were made around unpaid carers and, and all of that and there is a cost not only to the health and well-being of the young person who themselves need respite to be honest with you from their families in some cases because they need to see other people outside of their own home but also the carers and, and a, there's, a, there's a, a cost that is, is not only in terms of the financial cost but obviously in terms of their own health and well-being and, and how they are being looked after so we have a responsibility to them. I have had a, a specific meeting with your officials as you'll be aware on this issue but I really think it needs a focus, it needs a regional focus. We need to make sure that every single family right across the north are getting decent access to respite care. I know again that's not going to happen overnight but we need to see a plan. It needs to be put in place very much with carers at the centre of it and with those adults and, and young people who will be using the service at the centre of it. So I think again that needs to be very much co-designed. What is it that people actually need? Not let's put a service in place that is, does not meet their needs What in any way whatsoever. So I think really reaching out to carers, and I know sometimes that's difficult, but that's because we're dealing with people who have been fighting for years for every single thing that they've got for the people that they love. So I think if we can put some kind of, again, a plan in place, whilst accepting all of the issues around finances, this is not all about finances. In some cases, we have the facilities, we have the staff, we're just not using it well. No, I think that's something we can get our trust working together on in regards to, again, that collaborative approach as well, to get that provision back up to, to where it used to be, and expectation management as well. Thank you, Chairman. 
Thank you, thank you, Minister, for your last answer as well. Um, I hope that in, in doing so and looking at the overall structure of, of what respite is, um, that you can look around the issue of, of delayed discharge um, and why there are some children that are waiting over five years to be discharged from hospital settings. It is a real damn indictment of where we are if that's how we treat our young people and, and, and families. But I wanted to ask, you made a comment earlier or a response to a question um, and you gave just a one-worded answer to a question that will actually be very, very damaging for a very small number of people in Northern Ireland around puberty blockers. And I just want to ask the Minister if puberty blockers are now going to be um, paused or banned for all under-18s and not just Sorry, yeah. um, trans kids, because no. I, I think that there's a... It should not have been a single word answer. No, sorry, in regards, and I do apologise for any upset that may cause to anybody that has, has been listening in regards to, I, I answered Diane's specific question in regards to what was being followed, and I do apologise, and I think the member's right for trying. I was actually going to finish, Chair, in regards, just to, okay. to clarify in regards to that point, because I answered Diane's question in a, okay. a way that, was, that needed more explanation in regards to those additional supports that are already out there, but also how we look at what provision is currently in Northern Ireland and how it meets that nice uh, guidelines and concerns that have been raised in England. And I think it is very important that the Minister does meet with the LGBT plus organisations in Northern Ireland too, um, who are only too aware of the acute um, needs of, of young people in Northern Ireland who are left waiting waiting for years and then transferring to, to the adult um, wait as well. Um, so I just think it's really important that we're, well, we're and very have, careful. Uh, in my, my previous role, I've had quite a lot of engagement and uh, yeah. meetings with them on support from... Uh, those organisations as well in my role because I, I am conscious and I do apologise for any upset that may have been caused. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much. Um, I think that's been a very useful uh, discussion and thank officials as well for your attendance. It's certainly been very good and hope we can continue this engagement um, in the coming weeks and months. So thank you very much. Congratulations, chairing okay. your time. Thank you. Because <laughs> <laughs> we started late, so I'm, 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 we're not doing too bad. <laughs> yeah, but we have a good bit. So we get through. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn number three, the first item. I can't be booking Okay, members, um, we'll move on into item number six, and um, we are to ha having another briefing. Um, it's on the proposed LCM on the tobacco and vaping bill. Um, so, uh, as agreed at last week's meeting, so departmental officials have been invited to brief the committee on the department's plans to introduce an LCM in relation to the Westminster Tobacco and Vaping Bills. If we could refer you to the papers at tab six of your pack, pages 215 to 221. Um, and also in the pack at page 222 is a Department for he of Health press release on the, the bill. Um, Sinead McMurray from RAISE has also provided a research paper on responding to youth vaping, which members can find in their table paper, papers pack. Um, so I would then like to welcome um, the officials. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, good afternoon. You're very welcome, and, and thank you for your patience. We did run a wee bit over time, um, so just like to welcome the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Sir Michael McBride, Brian Dooley from the Health Improvement Policy Branch, and Karen Oldham um, from the Health Imp Improvement Policy Branch. So, we can I invite you to make your well, listen. Thank you thank for you. Uh, the invitation to attend this afternoon um, to brief you on the UK Government Tobacco and Vapes Bill. Um, as you know, the Department uh, has already advised the Chair and Deputy Chair um, that the Bill has not yet been introduced into uh, Westminster, so this restricts the detail that uh, we can provide on the actual uh, draft Bill uh, at this stage as it goes through the drafting stages. Uh, just to emphasise, however, I'm, I will be happy to come back uh, when we have more detail on the Bill to uh, provide further uh, briefing to the, the Committee. Um, as we know, smoking kills. 14% uh, of the Northern Ireland population over 16 continue to smoke, and that equates to some 2,211,000 uh, 211, people. We know that 
Many uh, smokers want to quit, but they simply cannot uh, due to an addiction to nicotine that started at a young age. Uh, we know that approximately two-thirds of uh, those who have ever regularly smoked started smoking regularly uh, before the age of 18. Uh, and across uh, the United Kingdom, over 80% started before they turned 20. Uh, we also know that two-thirds of smokers will die uh, directly as a consequence of smoking, um, and that smoking itself is a life-limiting uh, addictive habit. Uh, the department, as you know, has an uh, objective of a tobacco-free society within its uh, tobacco control strategy. And while we've made very good progress since that was published back in uh, 2012, we have more work that needs to be done. Uh, Westminster Parliament is about to, to debate a bill which, if passed, will produce enormous uh, public health benefits. Uh, Minister Swan, with the unanimous, unanimous support of the executive, has sought our inclusion in that bill, subject, of course, to executive consideration and agreement. The bill's headline, Smoke-Free Generation Measure, will make it a defence for anyone born on or after the 1st of January 2009 to be sold tobacco products. And in time, this new law has the potential to result in a generation who are free from the misery that tobacco addiction brings. In addition, we're expecting the bill will provide a number of regulation-making powers aimed at addressing the concerning increase in youth vaping that has been seen over recent years. So why do we need such measures? Well, uh, put simply, smoking increases the risk of 50 serious health conditions. For example, it counts for 70% of lung cancer cases, one in four of all cancer deaths. It, it, smoking impairs lung function, estimated to cause nine out of 10 cases of chronic obstructive airways disease. Smoking substantially increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks and strokes, and it increases the risk of premature birth and low birth weight. People with serious mental health conditions die 10 to 20 years earlier, and the biggest single factor in that is smoking. Smoking is a major cause of health inequalities. In Northern Ireland, uh, the incidence of lung cancer is two and a half times higher in most deprived areas than at the least deprived and smoking attributable deaths rates in our deprived areas are double those in the least deprived areas. In summary, smoking remains the UK's biggest preventable killer, resulting in 80,000 deaths a year in the UK and 2,000 locally. And over the last five years, approximately 12% of all deaths uh, can be attributed to smoking tobacco. Uh, in 2019-2020, in Northern Ireland hospitals spent £218 million treating uh, smoking-related conditions, and in the same year there were 38,617 uh, smoking-attributable hospital admissions. Uh, quite simply, the facts are clear. The World Health Organization has stated that the tobacco, and I quote, the tobacco epidemic is one of the biggest public health threats the world has ever faced. All forms of tobacco are harmful and there is no safe level of exposure to tobacco. As members will know, uh, the, in January 2023, the, New Zealand was the first country to bring forward legislation restricting the uh, sale of tobacco to anyone born after a specified date. Whilst their new coalition government uh, recently repealed these measures, we understand this was due to uh, taxation gaps rather than a concern about the effectiveness of the measures. A review taken forward in England in 2022 by Javed Khan, OBE, uh, recommended a smoke-free generation for England, and Dr Khan referred to this proposal as a critical intervention. In his report, he said, and I quote, I've asked myself if cigarettes had never existed and were invented tomorrow, what would happen? And the answer was simple. They would not be legalised. They would not be allowed into our shops and supermarkets. Critics may argue that the measures are an example of uh, public health interference or nanny statism and that adults should get to choose. In response to that, I would emphasise that these measures do not interfere with today's adult smokers. Rather, they seek to reduce future access to tobacco for children currently aged 15 and younger so that those children can break the cycle and avoid the generational harm that smoking brings. I cannot and do not believe that any of us would wish for our children or our grandchildren uh, to have a choice uh, to access an addictive product that will very likely end up killing them. The consensus response uh, to the consultation in Northern Ireland pointed to high levels of support for the measures uh, from Northern Ireland, the highest across the UK, with 
uh, in favour of the proposals. Uh, I've also heard uh, pro-smoking commentators make comparisons with the legal age which young people can do other things, can vote, drive a car, join the army, purchase alcohol, but none of these activities uh, will kill two-thirds of participants. Smoking poses a unique threat to public health and, in my professional view as Chief Medical Officer, undoubtedly requires the strongest of interventions. Estimates in England show that smoking costs the economy about £17 billion a year, whereas the tax raised in duty revenue is approximately £10 billion a year. In Northern Ireland, the British Heart Foundation recently estimated the cost of tobacco society here is £400 million annually. Every penny spent uh, dealing with tobacco-related harms is entirely avoidable and represents a huge opportunity cost to our health service and a financial cost to taxpayers. The costs of smoking to our economy and wider society are unacceptable. The costs to our health service are unacceptable. The human costs of smoking to families and people in Northern Ireland are simply unacceptable. And we now have a groundbreaking opportunity subject to consideration of this bill uh, by the Assembly in due course to change that for the next generation. If I could now very quickly move to uh, vaping, conscious of uh, me members' time. Vaping rates amongst young people here continue to rise. The recent Young Persons Behaviour and Attitude Survey data showed that a fifth of young people have used an e-cigarette at least once. Those in older age groups are more likely to have reported ever using, with uh, findings ranging from 6% for those in year 8 to 44% those <coughs> in year 12. Overall, current e-cigarette use rose from 5.7% to 9.2% in 2022. However, amongst year 12 pupils, the growth in current use has been particularly concerning with reported current use rising from 11.7% now to 23.6%. Now, we know that uh, e-cigarettes may have a role um, in helping some people to quit smoking, but the long-term harms of continued use are unknown. The Institute of Public Health has recently taken forward a rapid review of evidence on behalf of the department. It's still in draft, but we will share that with the committee in due course. And early findings confirm that vaping does act as a gateway to tobacco smoking amongst young people. And this substantiates my view and advice as Chief Medical Officer that measures to address the appeal of these products to children are justified. The consumption of nicotine in children and adolescents has deleterious impacts on brain development according to the World Health Organization, <laughs> leading to long-term consequences for brain development and potentially leading to learning and anxiety disorders. Uh, the UK uh, command paper also raised concerns about some of the uh, components and other ingredients in vapes, uh, which, when heated, uh, can produce toxic compounds. The long-term health impacts of inhaled colors and flavors are unknown, but they are unlikely to be beneficial. In addition, there are growing concerns about the significant social and educational harms of vaping with increased numbers of post-primary children at risk of disciplinary action, including suspension as schools attempt to deal with the numbers vaping on school premises. The UK government has um, announced the bill will include regulation-making powers to restrict flavours, packaging and point-of-sale sale <coughs> displays for both nicotine and non-nicotine e-cigarettes. They have indicated an intention to bring forward legislation that would enable regulation across the, the UK. Any subsequent regulations of that nature would, of course, be subject to further consultation. Um, and the UK government is also intends to address legal loopholes in relation to non-nicotine vapes and distribution. Now, obviously, the exact detail uh, of the regulation-making uh, provisions will be shared with the committee once we the bill is finalised, uh, which we still expect to be imminent. Uh, support for the proposed vaping measures in the consultation was again highest in Northern Ireland, with 75.6% of the respondents in Northern Ireland supporting a restriction on vape flavours, and 85.3% in Northern Ireland supporting a restriction on the display of vapes. Again, the measures are aimed primarily at protecting young people by addressing the unacceptable and increasingly blatant uh, marketing of those products to children. So in conclusion, it's our in, um, expectation that the bill will be introduced at Westminster imminently. Uh, following that, a legislative consent um, memorandum will be laid before the Assembly and a copy of the bill will be made 
available to the Health Committee as soon as possible to inform their consideration and report. And of course, as I said at the outset, I shall be uh, happy to return to the committee and give further detailed briefing at that time. Uh, just finally, in closing, um, we have a once in a generational opportunity in my view now, and I would just ask for the committee and members' support uh, as this proceeds through the Assembly by legislative consent motion. Thank you. Thank you, and I think that's been very comprehensive. It's probably answered some of the questions that we had already um, thought of. I suppose just, I mean, obviously the pace at which this yeah. can be introduced will cause some concern in, that, in terms of the ability of, of, of members and the Assembly to to look at that in detail. Um, so there's probably more questions once it is published. Um, I suppose from, from the outset, for myself, I would like to understand a wee bit more around what engagement the Minister has had with the British Government on this. And also, because I'm very conscious that we are, we are um, you know, particularly those areas or border areas mm. in, uh, on the island of Ireland, has there been any engagement with the, the Southern Government? Because um, coming from a border community myself, I'm very conscious of the fact that if in, in an area that could be a walking distance in a couple of minutes, there could be two very different um, sets of rules, regulations, um, and we want to try and align, I think, as best we can as well um, and have those discussions. So if you have any information sure. around that. i maybe make a few introductory comments and maybe then uh, Karen or um, uh, Brian can pick up. I think just to reassure uh, the committee that there has been extensive engagement um, at the Chief Medical Officer level with myself and my counterpart in the Republic of Ireland and also the four UK uh, Chief Medical Officers and this is something which uh, we c collectively uh, support uh, as an important policy opportunity from a public health perspective. Uh, there has also been um, extensive engagement between the respective policy teams including meetings between the policy teams uh, in the South, uh, Scotland, Wales, England and ourselves. Uh, so there has been very effective engagement and indeed there has been uh, uh, effective ministerial uh, engagement um, and there is a, a determination I think uh, from ministers to seek to progress this subject to consideration in their own jurisdictions by legislative consent motion to take this forward on a, on a UK wide basis. I don't know Karen if you want to, to add. Uh, yes, um, I suppose just to maybe uh, point out that the, the conversations around this did uh, sort of predate the return of the Assembly, the, the consultation exercise uh, launched in October. Um, so we have been in uh, at official level in, in discussion with the UK government at that stage in relation to the consultation and the Prime Secretary uh, give uh, agreement for our inclusion in that consultation. Um, and with the, the sort of caveat that you know decisions would be then subject to the return of the assembly. Um, so since that point, obviously with, with the return of the assembly, we've been sort of working at pace to sort of update our minister because the bill was getting to that finalised stage where we would need to, to sort of uh, make our intent or, or wishes known. Um, and the, our minister has, has been, I think, engaged on, on several levels with UK government. Um, um, both through correspondence and then in the last couple of weeks met with the Secretary of State to discuss it as well. Sorry, Secretary of State for Health, that is. Um, in terms of uh, the South, we have um, uh, quite close working relationships at official level there too, um, and we meet with them regularly. We know that they're facing similar um, challenges to us, and in fact they had a, an, a consultation close early January, so we did meet with them uh, a few weeks ago just to discuss uh, sort of where they were with that. They, they haven't published the outcome for their response to their consultation, but very similar issues uh, looked at, including um, age of sale um, and uh, flavours, vaping, the same kind of issues. There are a few different aspects to their consultation, but definitely uh, a lot of a lot of overlap. So, so we are very aware of, of the, the sort of parallels and the similarities there. And in terms of, of the, the point you're making about border communities, um, I think, I, I mean, we don't know exactly at this point what, what the Republic of Ireland might do with, with their consultation. Um, but I think it's it, if, if, for example, they were to take a slightly different model um, and, and I know some people have discussed maybe an age, uh, a raised age of sale of 21, um, and I know there's been a sort of an appetite for that among some mm. of the stakeholders in the mm. South. Um, if, if that were to happen, I don't think it would be the end of the world, because I think we would still have that position where 
um, that that smoking initiation age is sort of those late teenage years. Yeah. Um, and so if if someone, for example, living in Newry, um, was was not able to legally buy cigarettes there, um, and and the South had moved at their age to 21, there would be still that that benefit of you know by the time by the time they get past 21, that that age of um, initiation has has largely passed. No, and I mean, I think that it's good to know that those discussions are happening. I would just hate to think that we're doing all this in isolation and then, that you know, it, because essentially something that is going to be beneficial for the health of our public is key. So where we can align, I think, is, is very important because we, we, we do live on, on one island. Um, I suppose just one, two, one or two other questions I raise because I know others will have some. I mean, the youth vape and peace, and, and as you have highlighted in the figures, Michael, you know, the, 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 the increase in youth vaping is just shocking when you see it and it's, it's, it's snowballing. Um, and for all the reasons you've outlined, it's very attractive, but it's also very addictive. And I think that's something that's, that's very concerning. What engagement, if any, have there been with young people in relation to that? There hasn't been any direct engagement with young people at this stage. Um, there has been extensive engagement with the public health agency, with um, youth groups, uh, and around and schools, particularly around the issue around vaping. Uh, as mem some members may have uh, picked up this morning, the PHA has launched a, a series of leaflets and posters uh, around the very issue about uh, youth vaping uh, and an information sheet for parents about engaging and empowering parents to have that those discussions with, with children around the, uh, the issue around vaping. So, I mean, obviously there would be further engagement, Karen, just... Yeah, yeah. I'll maybe just mention not specifically in relation to to the consultation or or this, these particular proposals, but the public health agency um, did carry out, I think, last year, um, early last year, um, uh, some research within post primary schools, um, and that included surveys. Um, I think with uh, seven and a half over seven and a half thousand young post primary children, um, and focus groups with young people, interviews with staff. Um, so the, the, the analysis of that is sort of happening in stages, but that we have got some preliminary yeah. stuff back on that, and it includes that sort of highlighting the, 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 the significance of flavours in attracting young people to vaping. Um, so there, there, there's, there has been a, quite a bit of engagement there. As I say, that analysis is still underway, but that has also helped inform that series of um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, resources that, that uh, Michael just referred to that were published today. Okay, thank you. Linda? Just a, a quick point, because you, you have really answered sort of most of the, the questions I had. I, d I think there's an opportunity here. I know you're talking about public health agency leaflets and all, but let's be honest, most of those young people aren't reading them. That's no, just the reality of it. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of their parents don't necessarily know that they are vaping. And, and I have a declaring interest as a mother of a 15-year-old daughter who thankfully hates it, um, as do I, and I detest smoking. So, I mean... That that's my interest in, in all of this declared, but in, in all seriousness, I think the engagement piece with the young people, and I'm not necessarily saying that's that's a piece for yourselves. I think there's an opportunity to work actually with schools because you talked about you know that disciplinary action. Schools have choices; they don't always make the right ones. Mm -hmm. You know, disciplining children in, in these circumstances is not always the right thing to do. They also suspend children from school for having certain haircuts and wearing certain types of, of jewellery and all of the, you know, to me is just maybe not necessarily the right action to take, wrong committee to have the conversation, but I'm just making the point, there's, there's an opportunity here to actually engage directly with schools, with educational establishments, with education authority, youth services, different different services that have direct contact, Colin no more about this probably than most of us, but have direct contact with young people and can engage with them in a way that actually is meaningful to them, because doing what we have always done and expecting different outcomes, as we say in, in all of these things, is, is maybe a bit foolhardy. I think we need to find different ways to engage these young people and find out why they actually do it. You know, I know we're saying about that it's attractive and it's, you know, the, the smells and the tastes and all of which, again, just find disgusting. But some young people choose not to. Yeah. So, so why do the young people who choose to do it choose to do it and, and I think the only way to find that out having the conversation with them finding out and some of that can be done through through the school some of it can be done through other education and and services that deal with young people so I just think maybe having those conversations is something worth doing because there there is another piece to it 
I mean, in terms of what what's coming forward, we'll obviously look at it whenever we see what, what is actually published. But yeah. I mean, my position is to test them. So. <laughs> Well, well, that's I, a personal I, I position, not a, a party valid position. Point about engagement with young people. I think there's a, a significant behavioural science piece as to uh, what underlines uh, the choices and decisions that young people make. We know. I mean, I, I was young once myself, believe it or not, and we know that uh, young people do tend to, to uh, stress test boundaries. Do tend to experiment. The <coughs> difficulty is if you experiment with uh, nicotine vapes, you become, as you, as you quite correctly said, addicted, um, and. Um, you know, taking a, a, a an, an enforcement disciplinary approach to what is actually an addiction uh, is most likely not the most effective uh, way forward. And I, certainly I, I agree with you. I mean, there's already good engagement between the public health agency and other uh, educational authorities and bodies. And obviously it'll be, it'll be very, very important that we continue to progress uh, those relationships. I, I know, think uh, helping them to understand yeah. that is probably the, the, the approach. It's not telling, going in and telling schools what to do or how to, you know, how to do their own business, but it is about educating them as well, I suppose. So. Thank you, Chair. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Nuala. Um, thank you. Um, thanks for the briefing um, so far. I think it's, um, it is an opportunity that we should, um, we should certainly take um, and look forward to, to being part and seeing a, a non-smoking generation, hoping that we'll I'll live as long enough. <laughs> um, but with regards to what the bill will actually contain, um, and I appreciate the kind of the broad outline both in the presentation that you've given and the papers today, there was just one area I wanted to explore. Um, for example, the Northern Ireland chest, heart, and stroke um, would also have advocated for in the past and currently around um, you know the enforcement. I know that might not strictly just be um, Department of Health, so um, in terms of preparations for the upcoming bill um, is enforcement as it currently stands enough I mean I know my constituency office I deal with so many parents who are just so sick of standing in shops arguing with people behind the counter about selling the under um, underage um, young people and and you know enforcing getting local councils to enforce it. it takes it takes a long time you know we've only had successful outcomes in my constituency and a very few despite the volume of complaints that we're receiving um so what work is, is happening with regards to um kind of working along the, the enforcement side you, you raise an important point and i think i probably want to pick up or brian maybe on some of the detail of it but uh just just to reassure you that um um, councils sit on the tobacco uh, controlled strategy and are full members of that. Uh, we have indicated to councils, uh, and obviously you know the environmental health uh, teams within uh, district councils are responsible for uh, enforcement in Northern Ireland. Uh, so they're aware of, um, as, as far as we are aware of, um, the objective of uh, the bill and are supportive of that. Now obviously once we know what the actual detail of the bill is in terms of the operational impacts on that, then we will obviously engage further with councils in terms of considering what impact that will have on the current resources, for instance, that they have available to them uh, for enforcement. Because enforcement is a is a is a really important point. Mm. Um, and again, I also get that correspondence, you know, around as the department does around concerns about enforcement. The public health agency does uh, fund through the department. Um, uh, test purchasing uh, officers who will you know try and stress test whether or not retailers are who are uh, you know registered on the tobacco uh, register are actually complying with issues around um, displays uh, legislation age of sale etc um, and I, I don't have current data. Way, I, I, I don't currently have details on the <laughs> sort of number of fixed penalty notices, etc., or fines. I, mean, I don't know, Karen, if you have. Uh, we, I think we do have some details on the, the fixed penalties over the last six months. Uh, I, th I think um, I, I, I wasn't sure there if you were sort of talking about the tobacco or the, the vaping side of things, um, but I'm both. I, I, I think uh, certainly. Um, the, the numbers in terms of the offences detected in relation to tobacco has, has dropped, yeah. where, whereas the numbers of vaping offences yeah. has risen quite sharply. Um, so uh, one thing that I do know, and you mentioned uh, Northern Ireland Chest Heart and Stroke, uh, I, I think I'm right in saying there are advocates mm -hmm. for a, a retail register for, for uh, retail, retailers of, of e-cigarettes as well. Um, and whilst we, we have no immediate plans and that won't be addressed through this 
particular piece of legislation. Obviously, that is something that domestically we might uh, explore in due course. Um, we, we obviously have that register for tobacco, um, and I think what some of the councils would say is that it that it helps them in that. But I think I think one of the challenges with vaping is there's such a variety of of retail outlets for these things. It um, can be all kinds of unusual businesses selling them. So um, so I think that's something that uh, that has been raised certainly amongst our stakeholders. Um, uh, I hope I suppose one of the advantages of the, the measures in this bill is that. The aim is to sort of reduce that marketing and, and tackle that marketing of the products towards young people. So I suppose what you wouldn't hope that in time there would be less attraction there and therefore less test purchasing, etc., needed in the future as well. Thank you, and, and hopefully I'll I'll maybe um, examine a bit more of the the public, the PHA, and the the test um, samplers that, that go in because it really is getting I mean, all of us. It's it's getting so much correspondence around um, vapes in particular and shops selling them to children in uniform, you know, um, who, who look really young. It's, it's, it's deeply frustrating. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing this. So. Thank you. Uh, Diane? Thank you. Just two uh, very quick questions. Um, I'm kind of a little bit, um, well, concerned about being asked to look at a bill or, or to provide an LCM uh, on a bill with very little time scale for the scrutiny of that bill um, and I think it is important that we get as much information as possible as quickly as possible. You mentioned that the, the, the response to the consultation uh, from Northern Ireland, do we know how many specifically responded from Northern Ireland? So you know, how, how many responses there were from Northern Ireland? Yeah, there were, I mean, of, of the UK responses, I think Northern Ireland made up 4.5% of the total UK responses, so we punched well, well above our weight, uh, such was the level of public interest. Yeah. The number is over two. Yeah, 1,221 out of... That's really very significant. It yeah. is, it, it, yeah. it is mm-hmm. uh, I think it, that's exactly how we put it, we punched well above our weight in terms of... Uh, of the responses and, and our the support for the measures was also significantly yeah. higher in, in I think just about all of the areas um, from Northern Ireland. I think there was significant um, promotion before as a consultation came out to make sure stakeholders were aware and the stakeholders I think they wrote to the education department and maybe parents were informed as well to see if they could provide their opinions. So yeah, that's, that's it was I, I don't have an I don't have an issue with the, the, the actual aim or objective of the bill. I'd like to see how the bill works. I'd like to see the content, etc., etc. Um, do you understand, um, and, and maybe I missed, maybe you said this and I missed it, so forgive me, um, whether or not there is um, <coughs> going to be regulations in terms of the vapes themselves within the bill. Yeah. So in other words, sort of the, the content of vapes, you know, how, how they're, because it's, it's fairly, um, I remember in the European Parliament doing a lot of work on the tobacco issue when they le- and they left vaping completely um, regulation free. Is, is, is there going to be regulations in this bill around vaping and what you can put in vapes and the impact of, for example, flavours in vapes that encourage more people um, to do this more often? Is, is there going to be something like that in the bill? Uh, that was one of the things they, they certainly consulted on the the, the idea of flavours and packaging restrictions. Um, so I, th- I think the the commitment is to to explore that further. There was there was quite a lot of support again from from Northern Ireland for for restrictions around flavours, and I know there's concerns amongst some of our stakeholders about you know the the impact of heating those flavours, um, along with the other contents that 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 can be in vapes. Um, so uh, there's flavours certainly, um, I, and I'm not sure that there's anything else covering sort of any of the other chemicals, but I think flavours form a, a big area of concern at the minute themselves. Okay, okay. and just finally, um, the bill hasn't made it out of the uh, machine yet. Um, mm. Um, do we understand when the bill will make it out of the machine? And what's your honest assessment, given um, the very short time that this Parliament has to run, of anything actually being done in relation to the bill? I, is <laughs> Maybe that's too political. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's, not, it's above my pay grade. Um, I, I mean, the, the the word that we are getting consistently is imminent. So I think um, it, it is expected um, imminently. Um, I think that 
there's a high level of, of commitment to this, um, certainly uh, by the health ministers across uh, the UK, and certainly, uh, as you understand, also from the from the Prime Minister, um, and the obviously a very significant public commitment right across uh, the United Kingdom, and particularly a significant support for this in Northern Ireland. So I hope that um, there will be sufficient time to have this uh, bill laid, work its way through parliamentary process, uh, and obviously the bill to be considered fully and comprehensively and scrutinised uh, by the Assembly here in Northern Ireland. And uh, as I say, I hope that we have an opportunity to be on the right side of history on this. And I think this is something which we will look back on um, in five or ten years' time as a potential tipping point in relation to our, our commitment to uh, having a, a generation of, of individuals free from uh, addiction to tobacco. I think when it, before I just take in Danny, that when you look at when the, the ban came in on smoking indoors and it was a huge change. I mean, I can remember it as a t as a 18 year old at university and the change mm -hmm. and at the start people probably were quite reluctant around it and now it's just the norm and I think that has played its part in reducing the number of people smoking as well. We're so anything that moves that direction I think will be... We're just looking at some of those statistics and, and before coming along and even when we look introduced when the age of sale was increased um, in 2000 and... Eight. 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 You actually saw exactly that point mm -hmm. that when we introduce legislation it basically has a significant downward pressure on the number of people who take up smoking. So, uh, you know, legislation matters. Mm. Uh, policy is important. Legislation is really, really important in this space, and we, we can demonstrate that. I don't have the figures in front of me, but yeah, the increased illicit activity by about a quarter when it went from 16 to 18. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, thank you, Danny. Thank you, uh, and thank you for that presentation. Anything that um, reduces people smoking absolutely is a, a good thing, and certainly we'd be supporting it. Um, I've seen the posters from the, um, the Public Health Agency. It's quite an inspiring, <coughs> a quite good image, a strong image of a smoker with, or a smoke plume with a, a hand on the young person's shoulder. I think it is quite gripping, actually, and hopefully that will get around as much as possible. I think people don't appreciate just how addictive nicotine is, and I think that is part of the, the, the issue. Yeah. Initially, when vapes came out, they were seen as the safer choice for smokers, um, and that was a good thing, you know, because it would stop people inhaling combustible tobacco yeah. you know so you know this was the safer thing but they've now moved into um, a space where they're being marketed almost as sweets yeah. pineapple strawberry cola bright colors when you walk into a, a, a news agent's now there's a wall of these things you, you know it, shops devoted to them. absolutely yeah there's a, mm -hmm. shops devoted to them you know it's it is crazy how apparently completely unregulated it is for something that's very very addictive uh, and seemingly marketed it directly at young people to get them early. You've got a lifelong customer. I'm just wondering what research has been done into the, the long-term harms of vape. Obviously, the is a relatively new product, but just is there any research that sort of we can look at and say these are the harms that are attributable to this? Well, certainly, in my introductory comments, I made reference to the WHO's position in relation to um, the evidence in terms of you know young people in particular and developing uh, brains. Which, and the possibility of that being linked to uh, learning problems and difficulties and anxiety <coughs> disorders. I mean, the evidence, um, I mean, certainly it is, it is true uh, that uh, smoking and using e-cigarettes is less harmful than um, smoking tobacco, as you've indicated. My own position on this and my advice has always been a precautionary one in that you know, many, you know, two fifths of smokers have used, successfully used, uh, e cigarettes to quit smoking. Mm. Uh, others, unfortunately, substitute. If, if indeed e cigarettes have any place, it's only in the short term to help smokers who are addicted to tobacco to quit. Um, but there is emerging evidence of potential harm uh, from, from e cigarettes. But again, uh, as I say, it's not, it's not firm evidence at this point in time. Than, uh, Karen, do you want to? Yes, I mean, a, a lot of the, the evidence has, has, has either been contradictory or isn't just quite in a place yet where we can sort of put firm kind of, you know, it causes X, Y and Z claims on it. Um, I know uh, uh, Northern Chest, Heart and Stroke had, had published some information or, or evidence recently in relation to sort of um, uh, potential impacts on, on sort of cardiovascular systems, etc. And I think certainly in the short term, nicotine sort of raises blood pressure and heart rate, things like that. Um, I suppose a lot of the, the concerns around vaping in particular is the, the inhaling hot vapour and, and all the, the potential 
harms that go with that, um, as well as the flavours and things that we talked about earlier. So, so it is still very much a, a kind of a developing um, sort of evidence base. Um, but I think that that point is is the right one to make. That it, in in the while that long term evidence isn't there, um, we're, we're the we do seem to have enough evidence to show that it's significantly less harmful than tobacco because the tar in tobacco causes such a significant impact. But the absence, as we all know, the, as, as members will know, the absence of, of evidence d doesn't mean that there's an absence of harm. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I say, therefore, we, we need to adopt a, a precautionary approach. OK, and Alan Chambers. Thanks very much. Uh, certainly, uh, my, my party fully supports this, this bill and we welcome it. I think it is going to remove a lot of ambiguity around the uh, the sale of, of, of vapes and the damage, the long-term damage that they do. We've certainly moved on a lot from the days when a child could walk into some shops and push a few pennies over the counter and buy one single cigarette. Um, and uh, and that's really that's that that is a very good thing. I think sometimes as well we overlook the impact of. Um, you know, inhaled smoking, a non-smoker in an enclosed space is, is and we're reminded of the, of the tragedy of Roy Kessels, a performer who, who died, who never smoked a cigarette in his life, but died of lung cancer induced by the smoking that he inhaled and, and all the clubs and stuff that he would have performed in over the years. I think also you give a, a very stark figure there. I think there's always been this myth uh, that the government's been a bit hypocritical in that the, the amount of tax that they take in, uh, but on the other hand, uh, they're quite content to let people, you know, they, they talk about, oh, stop smoking, but they want the tax. But I think that figure you've given us of £17 billion uh, of a cost uh, to, to uh, presumably the health system um, and only £10 billion tax coming in. So I think that that, that kills that myth uh, a little bit. But in terms of the um, the ban on, on smoking in, in public places and in works vehicles and so forth, we've all seen the tangible outwork on a lot. You know, it's, it's just when you go into public places now, the, it's great not to come out with the smell of smoke on your, on your clothes. But the, has there been any research done um, in terms of, I know you've mentioned there about maybe seals falling and stuff, but has there been any research done in terms of the of, of medical outcomes of that? Of, of Have you noticed any, maybe it's a very difficult thing to, you know, to, to, to actually tie down that, but... I can't point to any specific, um, you know, benefits as, at this point in time in terms of reductions in um, incidents of... Um, there's bound to have disease, or <laughs> strokes, or heart attacks, etc. The difficulty is the it, it would be quite complex to untangle that because as an aging society, uh, we're all living longer, and that's a really, really good thing. The, the problem is we don't necessarily always live longer, healthier lives, and with an aging population, you will have uh, increased prevalence of, of cerebrovascular disease, strokes, etc., etc. Um, but certainly, um, there there is no doubt, given the direct harms, you know, when you think of the uh, strong evidence around lung cancer, strong evidence around chronic obstructive airways disease. If we can stop the next generation of young people becoming addicted to tobacco, we should uh, see a tangible impact on a wide range of those over 50 conditions uh, that I mentioned in my introductory comments. Um, and, and that is something that would be not only advantageous for the health of the population, would be advantageous in terms of the focus of the health service, and certainly in terms of the taxpayer, uh, yeah. would ensure that uh, we're not spending the money we're currently spending, tragically dealing with uh, the health consequences of smoking tobacco. I think there maybe is a bit of work to be done uh, in terms of consistency, as Neulis pointed out, maybe in her area. Um, the, 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 the councils may be not as active uh, in enforcing um, uh, the, the regulations around smoking, but I know in my, my constituency, Ards and North Downborough Council. There's a very robust programme there. Um, you'll get a letter uh, from the council, and you say, "Well, they're giving you a pre-warning." But sometimes, you know, that that pre-warning is, is is a good thing. And you'll get a letter, and you'll say that uh, we are conducting a, a a sample over the next, say, four months, uh, and here's the consequences if you're detected selling it. Your staff member will be fined. The shopkeeper will be fined. 
Uh, and that does give, that's a, a good weapon for a retailer to use with the staff to make sure that they, they check everybody's uh, ID. Uh, and also, the, if, I think if a retailer is caught out, and I could be, uh, I may be wrong here, but I think that if a, a retailer is caught out on two occasions, they actually can use or lose their license to sell tobacco products. Um, so that, that's that, that, that's a very good weapon as well. But I think maybe the department, maybe it, it is that there's a bit of work to be done there to try and create that. You know, look at what council is is, is producing the best model and which are not really yeah. doing that. And just, oh, yeah, I was just going to add. Um, we we recently had a, an audit completed by the Northern Ireland Audit Office on on smoking measures, and one of their recommendations is actually um, about sort of developing some kind of quality standards in relation to enforcement. Um, so, so I think that is something we will be sort of yeah. having to look at with the PHA in in due course. Yeah, I think that would be useful. Yeah. The other point you made, I thought, was very interesting, is about secondhand smoke. And some studies have found out that that's a, an area that we maybe should be focusing on more rather than the outdoor smoking, mm. because you've got children and young people who are basically at hostage at home inhaling tobacco smoke. Yeah. Um, and that's why there has to be, in all of this, there has to be balance going forward in terms of potential unintended consequences, because uh, if obviously been exposed to secondhand smoke in an outdoor area, a park or whatever, well, not ideal, but lower risk. But if, if we and we had uh, research available which to us, uh, I think it was from the University of Sterling, Sterling which pointed to that very point that um, we need to be conscious of the health inequalities impacts. If you actually restrict smoking in too many outdoor places, what happens then is you potentially could run the risk of exposing uh, young children whose parents smoke mm -hmm. uh, to increasingly higher levels of smoking in the home which obviously carries much greater risk. So in all of this, there's a need for balance and proportionality in terms as we progress our way th through. Thank you. Yeah, and just, I'll take you in there, Nila, just a very quick one on that as well. I would, and it's not probably not something you can answer today, but I will be interested even to see as we go through this. And vape fumes are very, they, they hang about for, uh, you know, you can see it nearly um, for a while after someone has used a vape. And I'd be very interested to find out a wee bit more about the secondhand vape. Uh, you know the impact of that because I think it's it's probably possibly even more than than cigarette smoke. It lingers for a long time. You know I don't know what it is to do with the density of it or what it is, but it's something I always notice and I often wonder what the the potential harm around that would be for anybody in the because there's not as much. Um, I think vaping is almost a wee bit more acceptable in public spaces than smoking. So it's people aren't as as cautious around that. So it's just something I thought about. But I know it's not something you probably yeah, we, can ask I, again. We can update the chair. I think it'll be interesting. There is some in research it. in that space uh, from cancer research, for instance. Um, you know, some preliminary data suggesting mm -hmm. that it's absolutely yeah, much less harmful certainly than uh, being exposed to secondhand tobacco smoke. Uh, not likely to be harmful, but again, there's no definitive yeah. evidence in that space either. So hence the need for. Going back to that point you made, Michael, around children. And you know, and particularly where there's maybe people who have moved on to vaping because they're trying to get away from cigarette smoking. Um, but is there, you know, especially in closed settings and things like that, is there is there potential for harm? So yep. yeah, thank you, Nuda. Did you want to come in there? Yeah, it's just quick. Um, and I know um, not 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 contradicting what you're saying, but it just reminded me around the um, you know, restricting the, the smoking in more public places might drive it indoors. But it just made me think around the the smoking in, in the hospital. Mm -hmm. premises, yeah. premises and forgive me what was asked when I was out of the room but um, you know, where are we in terms of like um, you know no smoking outside the, the, the hospital facilities having a smoking kind of um, ban around the hospital area and not just where like they move down the door, door a wee bit um, and it doesn't actually and it goes in the windows anyway but um, I mean if you're talking about prevention people in the hospital um, no um I, I maybe give a little personal anecdote, which I think is illustrative of some of the challenges there, but I don't know whether you want to pick that one up about premises, hospital premises. Uh, well, there, there are policies and trusts where they can um, restrict that, but obviously we don't have the regulation mm -hmm. in relation to that. It is, um, you know, I've, I've had those conversations with individuals smoking on hospital premises uh, in my former roles and responsibilities over the years. Um, and I think that as all trusts have policies in place about smoking on their premises. 
Um, and you know, that, that, that those have been there really from 2006, since the, when the, legis the legislation was uh, first uh, introduced. I think there is much more that can be done in that space. Um, the conversations I've had with individuals, sometimes I understand, and, and they've been useful conversations, but when you have someone, a conversation with uh, someone who's uh, smoking uh, outside a building and they say, well, actually, I've got terminal lung cancer and um, I'm smoking because I have a short number of months left. Uh, I remember that conversation with that lady very well and very vividly, and I, I spoke to her every day then. As I met her, she was smoking her cigarette outside the cancer centre. Um, and similarly, I've had uh, conversations with individuals who've been smoking on hospital premises when they've had a relative who's been uh, in intensive care. Uh, and I think we have to always ensure that in all of this, and it's back to the same issue around um, schools and what is an, addictive, an addiction to nicotine, we need to have balance in all of that. I think absolutely health should be uh, signposting the way ahead and hospitals should be signposting uh, whether it's around healthy eating or encouraging exercise and, and employees or supporting employees or in smoking should be leading the way. I think we just also need to be mindful of the very human aspects of, of this and particularly people who have an addiction uh, to, to tobacco and when they're stressed, it, it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think we do, do need to be uh, empathetic in, in how we approach it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. I think that's been very helpful and I'm sure we'll can pick up this conversation again in in the coming week, so we, but we appreciate you coming today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Members, just based on, on the conversation then, um, I think it might be worthwhile to invite the Institute for Public Health to brief the committee on its work in relation to this and potentially some engagement with the Youth Assembly as well, if members are agree agreeable to do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Members, if we can move to item number seven then, is SL1, the recovery of health service charges amounts, amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2024. If I could refer you to tab seven of your pack, which is page 225. Um, members, the department is proposing to make a statutory rule to extend the recovery scheme within the Health and Social Services Act 2001 to include personal injury compensation and cover the costs that are paid by the insurance industry. The statutory rule will be subject to the negative resolution procedure and is expected to come into operation on the 1st of April 2024. Are members content with the merits of the policy and that the department makes the statutory rule? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Item number eight is correspondence. If I can refer you to tab eight, which is page 229 of your pack. And um, there's a couple of items just to draw your attention to. Item 8.2 at page 230 is a reply from the Minister of Health providing further information following the re recent budget briefing and I know we kind of looked into that. Nula, did you want to raise anything just in relation um, to the way this stuff? Um, yes, no, I just um, um, I just was a bit concerned seeing everything we had asked rather specific questions as to what with regards to the waiting list but I know that we have um, that coming up on the committee agenda next week so I'm happy to wait until then um, if I can ask that this is placed on the agenda again for members. Um, item 8.9 as well, it kind of links to what I've just um, suggested in the back of the briefing. Um, it's correspondence from the Youth Assembly who have requested to engage with the committee and given the, um, the, the, what we've just discussed on the LCM, um, I would be happy for, the, for us to invite them in and maybe are engage with them, whether it's in committee or, or in, a, in an outside briefing, if, if members are happy enough with that. Linda? Can we just maybe give them an idea, are there particular things they want to engage <coughs> with us on or, or do they want us to come up with I'm just thinking it would be more beneficial to us if, if they tell us what they want to engage yeah. with us on. And if we have things then that we would like to ask their... Yes, their we, I, I've had an initial discussion with the, the, the staff at the Youth Assembly and the, the Youth Assembly has health as a priority now, so they have a committee of 30. Um, young people on, on their health committee so they're just keen to engage in committee processes so I, I'll be speaking to them tomorrow to see how we can engage a bit further and get an idea of what they're they're looking to do but um, as the chair said we, we had thought possibly the LCM coming up uh, seeking their views on mm -hmm. yeah. on that as a first a first stage as part of the engagement and then seeing how else we engage in 
in the coming months as well. Yeah. It might need to be after committee, albeit that most of our meetings go well on yeah. after school time, but if they're at school, they're maybe not going to be finishing to half three or wherever they are, and then they'll have to get here. But I say... Definitely. Yeah, well, we, we've, we've sort of had a discussion around that and how we can best work around that, so... Would that, what would that be for the Well, that's what we need, we need to... Oh, you're going to have it. Like we, we've it. had an initial discussion. Um, I think they are keen, as part of it, to come and see a committee in action. Yeah. So it is so... Um, th- they may well get a letter from um, the, the, the speaker here asking, could they leave school for the afternoon? Part um, of their education. To come along mm-hmm. um, to the committee and engage with the committee. So I hope so. there are ways of, of, of looking to see what we can do. But Educational trip. Mm. Yeah. Educated out of school. Okay. Um, members, are you happy then to con- to note the remaining actions in the correspondence as listed um, on the memo? Yeah. Item number nine then is the draft board work program. If I could refer you to the three documents at tab nine of your pack at page three hundred and nineteen. Uh, members, a tour of Marie Curie Hospice in Belfast has been arranged for twelve p.m. on Thursday, the eleventh of April. Um, prior to our committee that day. So this will be for an hour and then we we'll return to, to Parliament Buildings for our, our committee meeting. Um, we also have a briefing from the junior doctors confirmed um, for the 9th of May and a briefing from the department on the Delivering Together progress report. Um, obviously we discussed it at the week with the, um, last week with the, uh, the officials on the, the transformation piece and it has been scheduled for the 27th of June. And we are waiting for confirmation then from RQIA. Dates have been offered to them to attend the committee meeting as well. So are members content to note the briefings that set out in the forward work programme? Yep. I need to um, just ask, is there, a, is there a plan in this to meet the dentists? I think we... Given the issues that are swirling around? Um, y- yes, Chair. Um, it, it is something that we have scheduled in June. So we have to meet with um, the BDA coming and I think the department's coming, um, mm-hmm. Chief Dental Officer um, on on dentistry. So there, there will be one meeting where that will be the focus of mm-hmm. the meeting. It, it, it is a date in June. I can't remember off the top of my head which one it is. 13th of June, Alan's way ahead of me here. Um, yeah. Okay, and just to remind members yeah. that there's an informal meeting schedule for one o'clock on Tuesday, next Tuesday, the 19th. Um, in room 20, 29 with officials regarding the integrated car system. So if anyone, what you will have got an invite by email as well, but just to remind people of that. Item number 10 then, is any other businesses, any members, any other items of business they wish to raise? No. Um, so the date and time of next meeting is Thursday 21st of March at 2 p.m. in room 29. And the meeting pack um, will be issued to members tomorrow due to the bank holiday Monday. And just to thank members, everyone was was really good at, at keeping kind of to the time. I think it was very, very good and we hopefully covered as much as you'd like to cover. So we did the adjourn and see from everyone. Committee Room 29, Sound.